for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, hello and welcome to the February 25th, 2013 Board of Commissioners meeting. Before we start this meeting, I would like to take a moment to um, offer our collective thoughts and prayers for one of our officers tonight. Um, Officer Anthony Radico is in the hospital right now. He suffered a very serious heart attack and um, is fighting for his life right now. So if we could, as a community, give our thoughts and prayers towards his recovery. Um, we, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with him and his family. He has three children, and um, we're all thinking about him and pulling for him and looking forward to seeing him again. Secondly, I would like to announce three minor changes to the agenda. Um, first, item number three has been removed. It's the um, presentation of the Girl Scout flag to the police. There's been some travel arrangement, uh, some traveling that has uh, interrupted that. It will be on a future agenda. Second, item E, under finance, the dis, uh, disbursements we, we has been taken off because they were not posted in time on the internet. And then finally, item P, under personnel and administration, um, that will be up, that's a resolution that will be up for discussion, not a vote tonight. Okay, uh, having said all that, I'd like to invite anyone who has to leave early to step up for public participation. Hello, Dan Webster, 242 Ravens Cliff Road. As a Radnor taxpayer, I want to express my hope that the Board of Commissioners will exercise common sense and fiscal responsibility when considering any acquisition of part of the Ardrossan estate or any other property in Radnor Township. At your January 28th meeting, you approved an open space acquisition evaluation and documentation policy. I hope that you will follow that policy despite the comments at that meeting made by my own Ward 3 Commissioner, Bill Spingler, suggesting before the policy was even adopted that he could disregard it and do whatever he and three other commissioners want to do. I think such a responsibility is an affront not only to the volunteers on the Open Space Subcommittee who expended so much effort crafting the well-intentioned policy but also disrespectful to the 10,000 plus tax paying property owners in Radnor Township. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment? Sarah Pilling, 29 Garrett Avenue, Rosemont, and one of the coordinators of the Skunk Hollow Community Garden. I just wanted to let you know we're off and running. We have added 13 more family units to the garden this year. Uh, and thus, we're going to build four new plots. That's 12 beds, plus some people have reduced their amount. Two families did leave. Um, they have signed the liability statements, which will be delivered to the township, because I know that's one of the requirements. Uh, we want to say thank you to the Radnor Conservancy, who can add us under their liability policy for $10, whereas it was going to cost us $800. And uh, in building the four raised beds, we're going to con uh, four plots, which is 12 beds, we're going to continue our policy to uh, do business with local, inst local businesses, so do it best is going to sell us the wood and help us get it there and we will build it. Um, I want to give a special thank you to the Parks Department, to Steve Norsini and to Mark Dominic because without their support we would not be able to uh, move along as smoothly and as easily. We've got, we're get, all getting a little older and our backs are getting a little tired and they are just tremendous to us and it feels like a vote of confidence. The second thing I wanted to do was to remind you, and I will be sending you notices this week, but also the listening public of the Rain Barrel Workshop on Sunday afternoon, March 10th, at the Radnor United Methodist Church. These, this program is part of a REN grant, which is EPA money to DEP, to the League of Women Voters, to their REN program. And the Garrett Hill Coalition is very pleased to be able to sponsor this. We will have Brian uh, Vedino of the Delaware County Conservation District speak. 
Steve Norsini will give an update on the stormwater uh, ordinance and a young couple from Phoenixville who've started a company called Camel's Hump Rain Barrels will be giving the nuts and bolts of how to do it. There will be door prizes in the form of three rain barrels, one given by Garrett Hill, one given by the Radnor Conservancy, and one by the library. And every person who attends and who stays to the end receives a certificate, which is good for a very sizable discount for a rain barrel from our friends at Do It Best Hardware. So we'd really like people to come. There's no cost and no registration necessary. Just come. I think you're going to learn a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and congratulations on your success at Skonkala. That's really tremendous. Hi, uh, Mia McCall, 420 Midland Avenue, and I'm here tonight um, regarding agenda letter J under public safety, the proposed stop sign at Midland and St. David's. and. Um, those of us on Midland are very appreciative of having this, this on the agenda. So thank you for your consideration. Great. Thank you for coming out. I'm Cheryl Tamola. I'm also from Midland Avenue. And I'd like to second uh, Mia's uh, appreciation for this uh, ordinance. Um, I think we began working on this over 15 years ago, so it was a long time coming, and I'm very appreciative of it. I'd also like to say, since while I'm up here, <clears throat> that I uh, am quite excited about the adoption of Ordinance 2013-01 uh, regarding the Land Development Ordinance. Um, in case those of you don't know this, in the in a 1970 Park and Rec plan, there was a sample ordinance that said this. It's somewhere in the 1970s, I can't remember the date, the actual year now. So it, that's another thing that's taken us a long time. <laughs> but I'm so I'm glad we're making progress. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seeing no other further uh, public comment, we'll move on. I'd like to announce that we had an executive session immediately preceding this Board of Commissioners meeting tonight on the 25th. All commissioners were present, and we uh, discussed matters of personnel, litigation, and real estate. Next, uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes for the Board of Commissioners meeting of November 26, 2012? I so move. Second. Does anybody second? Second. Any commissioner comment? Any staff comment or public comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 7 to 0. May I have a motion for to approve the minutes of December 3rd, 2012? So, so moved. moved. Second. Who, who moved? Uh, John Nagel? John Nagel, I second. Okay. Any commissioner comment, staff comment, or public comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? One abstention. Uh, I was absent from that meeting. Okay. The motion passes 6 to Zero with one abstention. Next, uh, we w can I have a motion to accept the departmental reports? Are we going to make an appointment tonight? Oh, did I skip that? I'm sorry. Next, we have appointments to various boards, commissions, and committees. And John Fisher is the um, chair of our personnel and administration committee, and he's going to make that announcement. Okay, I'll move to approve appointment of Elizabeth Springer to the Planning Commission. Second. Any. Commissioner comment, staff comment, or public comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes seven to nothing. And just a quick comment that we still have three vacancies on the Citizens Communications Council, two vacancies on the G Garrett Hill Implementation Committee, one on the Comp Plan Implementation Committee, two vacancies on Shade Tree Commission, and one vacancy on the C uh, Code of Appeals Board. Great, so, thank you, John. So please send in your letters of interest to the manager. Okay, next, can I have a motion to accept our departmental reports? So move. Second. That was Jim Higgins seconding. Do we have any commissioner comment on this? I actually wanted to make one comment um, on uh, something we received from our finance department. Uh, it's a little, just a little bit of good news I thought we'd share because we always need good news. Um, our real estate transfer tax numbers that came in for January were unusually high. Um, we collected $240,000 for the month um, with 37 transactions. 
January is usually a pretty sleepy month, so that's quite um, extraordinary. And for a point of reference, uh, in 2012, for January, we collected 140. Uh, in 2011, we collected 170. In 2010, 136. In 2009, 105. So it's a significantly higher number for January. And let's keep our fingers crossed that it continues to say, stay that high. Any other comment? Any staff comment or public comment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes seven to nothing. Next, we move on to our committee reports. First, we have community development with Commissioner Curley. The first item is the adoption of ordinance 2013-01. So does that, someone want to make a motion? So move. Second it. So uh, I'm, I voted against it last time. I'm going to vote against it again. My opinion is that we're, people are paying taxes. They don't need uh, to be taxed again. So in my mistake, this is, in my opinion, this is a mistake, and we should vote against it. I'm also voting against it. And on top of that, if you go through the Crestwood report, we have significant amount of underutilized park and rec facilities. This is just another tax on people. Uh, could I? ask a question of uh, Kevin um, then there's a dollar amount in the ordinance of $3,307 per dwelling unit <clears throat> is the um, fee that a developer could pay if the site is inappropriate or under you uh, doesn't have the capacity for actual grant of open space. How, how did we arrive at the 3307? That fee is based off of a ratio, a series of ratios and calculations, starting with the general recommendation of 10 and a half acres of recreation land for every thousand residents. And when you calculate that out, you end up with approximately 1,440 square feet of recreation land that would be required per dwelling unit and then putting that into a ratio of what that land would cost at 1,440 square feet is based off of a ratio of one acre of land costing $100,000, which was the amount of an, an appraisal that we had um, researched in preparing this. Um, so all so those numbers you gave us were based, Radnor-based numbers, they're not correct. theoretical yes. or statewide or anything like no, that? No, they're, they're local numbers um, based off of the population in the township and based off of an actual appraisal in the township. All right. I want to make sure I've read this ordinance correctly. Am I correct that there's nothing in the ordinance that requires the developer to actually make the donation of land out of the lands that he's developing? In other words, if there is a choice piece of property elsewhere in the township that the developer or the you as or staff feels is is worthy of being transferred to the township or to a private organization that will maintain it then that parcel could be the subject of the transfer there's nothing in the ordinance that says you cannot go outside the developed land to to make this Correct. Sure. We can require and mandate that the land be dedicated, but then there are options that are at the discretion of the developer if he wants to choose to do land within the development, land outside of the development, um, construct recreational facilities on township-owned land, or provide the fee in lieu of. Okay. That's good to know because we might have some developments that just aren't suited for finding a piece of it that uh, meets all the other criteria in the ordinance that would be of a benefit to the public. Correct, and this, this provision would be in our subdivision land development ordinance, so if there was an unusual circumstance that was facing a development, um, the developer could always request a waiver from the provisions of this ordinance. Okay. And the last point is at the very end of the ordinance, um, this would be the end of section 1, subsection 3C, we have reference to supervisors, and I think we should be talking about Board of Commissioners there. This is on page four of the ordinance, 3C. It says supervisors. Correct. That should reference commissioners. Board. So 
if the person that made the motion will take my amendment, then I will second that. So moved. Second. Okay. Is there any other commissioner comment on this motion as amended? Uh, I, uh, just a, a brief comment. Uh, I, I missed this the first when we introduced. The um, Planning Commission re had recommended, this is the Delaware County Planning Commission had recommended that we clarify um, how the funds can be spent. Um, and in section, this is also on page four, uh, section three B, uh, in general, it's providing that um, the fees that are collected should be used in the area uh, that would benefit the, the development. So if there's a large development being built, the fees would be collected and be used to purchase uh, park land and improve park land for, and for the benefit of those residents. But we, we have a provision in here that allows that money to be used in other areas of the township. And I think while I understand that we have the latitude to do that, um, it kind of strikes me as uh, contradictory in its purpose. So, um, and I, I, I appreciate the, the uh, Delaware County Planning Commission generally gives us very, uh, very good comments. And this one I happen to agree with. Um, I, I think it's problematic in some ways to allow that money to go into kind of a slush fund and then be used by another commissioner in another ward for their purposes um, rather than allowing that money to stay in the area where it was generated. So I'd ask that this board except, consider. Except, John, at the development that where the developer has to make the donation or make the transfer, the ultimate beneficiary beneficiaries are not the people that live around that development or live in that uh, district as defined in our 1991 open space plan, but it, it redounds to the benefit of everybody that lives in the township. So I don't think it's too narrow approach to say that the money could be spread around the, the entire township and doesn't have to stay within the district where the development occurs. Yeah, I, I think the the language maybe it's a language issue, but it, in in the um, <clears throat> first sentence it says, "Any such fee shall only be expended within the applicable park planning district as set forth on Map Three of the Radnor Township Parks and Recreation Open Space Plan of 1991." And then it's comma or as may be amended, except that fees from the district may be used to township wide for township-wide community parks and recreation areas. I don't, I don't know, I just, in its present form, I think it, you know, I guess to speak a little bit to Kevin, Commissioner uh, Higgins' comment that this looks, you know, like a tax. I, I just, I think it's important that, I, granted, there are gonna be instances where the money's co collected or where lands cannot be set aside at that development and that money will have to be put into an escrow fund and, and held by the township, but you know, what I hate to see is that that money be then in turn used in some further reach of the township, further end of the township. I mean, whether it's all the way down my end or vice versa, I just, I don't know. I think the wording there is a little contradictory. The Planning Commission thought that it was a little bit contradictory. They recommended that we, recon you know, maybe strike the word only. Uh, well, I, I guess see your point. I, I um, that notion <coughs> rings true with me as well. However, I, I read it with, um, we do, it gives the, whoever's sitting on the Board of Commissioners at the time this is invoked, the sort of an expansive um, list of opportunities with a preference for putting, you know, first and foremost, it should be in the park district. If that, short of that, and I read it, you know, having that be the primary clause, and then, or somewhere else if you can't 
to me that expresses that that's, the, that's our preference. If that doesn't work for some reason, then you get more expansive ability to, to put that money towards other open space. So I feel pretty comfortable with that language. And I support this um, as amended, um, and as drafted and amended. I think this is a really important tool in our arsenal of um, our efforts to kind of counterbalance the negative effects of continued development and continued density in our township. Um, and I think it will be useful to us in the future. Um, so I support it wholly as amended. Do we have any other comments? Madam, Madam President, if I may. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. First, I just want to commend Kevin for his hard work and efforts in putting this together and the time and efforts to bring this forward. Second of all, I know the administration supports this, but this is also something when we look at uh, de redevelopment, development, expansion, growth, that instead of taxing the current taxpayers here and putting the burden upon current residents who live here to help improve our recreational areas, that those who are going to be making an impact into the community, that they pay their fair share, that they're going to utilize these park and recreational facilities, that they contribute to that. So in my opinion, it would be as this way we shift the burden to those residents who live here now instead of those who are coming in or businesses who are expanding or redeveloping, that this is a way in which you know, we can wordsmith it to however it is, but in reality, we're putting this on folks who want to be here, expand, that it's on them of the impacts they're going to make to our current parks, to our current residents, that they pay their fair shares of the impacts they're going to have. And again, I think this is very good. I commend the board and hope the board considers this. And again, I want to thank Kevin for all his hard work and efforts to bring this forward. Kevin, I, you did a nice job, but Bob, I disagree with you. I, I know you spent your entire career in government. The seller is going to get hit for that. The developer will not eat that cost. The purchase price will be affected by that. That that is a correct statement. However, that that whoever the seller or buyer is knows eyes wide open coming into it what the impact is, and they should pay for it. Because the other alternative is that though the residents like myself and others who live here help pay for those improvements that these new folks coming in are going to make an impact to our parks and facilities, and they should pay onto that. And I think this is a good practice for us to have. Okay. Do we have any other commissioner comment? Or any other staff comment? Do we have any public comment on this? Okay, I will go ahead and call the vote. It's been moved and seconded um, with the amendment from, who made that amendment? You, Jim? Jim Higgins. All in favor say aye. 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 And those opposed say nay. Nay. It passes uh, five to two. With Commissioners Curley and Higgins opposing. Kevin Higgins. I move the adoption of Ordinance 2012-11, amending Chapter 280 of Radnor Township Code Zoning Ordinance, amending the heights of athletic field light standards in the PLU district. Second. Second. Bob, is there any reason we're doing this now? Is there something we're contemplating doing? I think as part of this, what the discussion was, which is going to be well over a year ago, uh, as part of Memorial Field, Agnes, sir, when there was some consideration about lighting that, I believe that's the only area of the township that this would, would be looking at. But again, this one has been in the conversations for months and months, I believe, to get to this point today. I, mean, I know we got protections in here, but yes. 85 feet of lights in a budding a residential neighborhood is awfully high. It, well, it, it, what's it, important to remember is that prior to this, the commissioners would just say, put the lights up. There was no ordinance governing it, no protections. What this has done for us is provided those protections and codified the way those decisions get provided made. Provided those protections at 85 feet, not at 37 or so, whatever it was. No, in the past, you, how do you think we put the lights up at the high school? We just did it, right? The high school doesn't abut a residential neighborhood. The point the is, is right it's PLU. The <laughs> John, if I, I think I understand. I think I understand your point is that before we had unlimited height. Exactly. Now we have 85 feet. So you view this as a restriction, not as. Not just, you know, it's not just the height that's the restriction, it's also the spillage. Right. Okay, do we have any other commissioner comment? Just a quick question. Uh, again, the, um, the note from the Planning Commission. Uh, I think this is the Planning Commission. I don't see actually who it's from. It looks like the Planning Commission. 
they they recommend that the proposed regulations that they appear reasonable however prior to adoption the township engineers should ensure the proposed technical lighting standards are consistent with nationally accredited sports lighting standards by contacting the IES uh, illuminating engineering society the ANSI American National Standards Institute and the OSHA which uh, occupational safety and health administration we don't really have a lot of technical standards in here other than the height and the foot candle but uh, Steve is that something that we I mean it, it would seem to me that we're compliant but has have we made sure that these stand the technical standards actually the, the, the only technical standard I can I can really see here would be the 0 0.2 foot foot candle um, and the question is have we reviewed this standard against any of the standards that hasn't gone through uh, engineering but I know Kevin uh, I think you're I can I can touch on that, that. Was done. it's actually going to vary depending on the application um, every site is going to be unique so okay. when we have an application that's in front of us to put up athletic field lighting we would take a look at the design of that and make sure that all of those parameters are being met for that um, but each site is going to be different in what those parameters are so to put in a technical requirement that could vary from site to site um, be very cumbersome in an ordinance like this but those would things that we would do as part of actually engineering the project um, once it would come in front of you for approval mr. madam president if I may also Commissioner Nagel with his background in this actually I believe we made this even tighter at the, at the last meeting as well so I think we've we've got a, a very good standard here yeah I, but there's only John, one wouldn't, wouldn't it be appropriate that much like we endorse the uh, NEC and, this, and the uniform building code and those things that we should amend our codes section not this is zoning That's to, uh, to yeah. add those appropriate references right and again there, there's this ordinance doesn't have a lot of technical specification no. so I don't see it as an issue but I just want to make sure yeah. that we did it no I would recommend that we go ahead and amend codes to uh, reference those standards because we have other issues in the township, Kevin, that you've come across where lighting is an issue. It would probably yeah, the, be very helpful to us. There to are various standards. Um, the zoning ordinance does provide some language for enforcement of, of those. Um, this would kind of, we would keep those in, in mind when we're reviewing and actually designing um, for athletic field lighting. After all, these are going to be township parks mm -hmm. um, and property and our lights and our electricity bills that we're going to be paying. So we're going to make sure that we're very judicious in um, the light levels that we have out there that's not too much or not too little. Okay, do we have any other I have questions? a question for John Rice. Are you paying attention, John? I see you looking down. <laughs> okay, I, I just thought you might be looking at something else. John, just tell me you always pay attention. Okay. Can you, if you look at three, it says light fixtures shall be shielded to reduce, not eliminate, light spillage beyond the extent of the property line. Then you look at four, and it says light fixtures shall be positioned so that uh, essentially it doesn't shine directly onto adjacent properties. It seems to me they're a bit inconsistent. Well, they're different. I don't know whether they're inconsistent. I think that. The idea there is to. I guess it depends on where the property sits. Pardon me? Ke Kevin, depends four is. Property sits. Kevin, excuse me. Four is referring to the uh, impact on drivers on no, the street. No, it's also saying directly onto adjacent properties. And or directly onto adjacent properties. Um, yeah, so maybe it's a little bit redundant. But I think the concept is the light ought to remain on the property that has the facilities on it. Then should you say, on three, should you say eliminate instead of reduce? I would leave it as is um, at this point it's been advertised the other thing I think the board needs to keep in mind is um, this is only going to happen on township property so someone's not going to come in and propose light spillage or tall light facilities on private property on school district property or any other property so whatever the standards are going to be who's ever sitting up there and your professionals are going to determine what the standards are. There is a standard in the uh, Memorial Field lease that was put in there dealing with uh, specific sports lighting for under that lease. So if that's the first one you see, there's a standard in there already. But regardless of all that, 
you know, you're going to control what happens with this ordinance and how it gets in, implemented on township property. So I'm fine with the redundancy. It's inconsistent, not redundant. Commissioners, in, in actuality, that um, section four also plays off of the heights, where we're, we're talking not light spillage, but light shining directly off of site into a road um, plays directly into the height of the light. That the higher the light structure, the more angled down the light can be and more focused on the playing field versus the lower, the more projecting the light would be. So we looked at parameters with that and felt that the 85 was a, a comfortable range with what we see typically for athletic field lighting. Um, but three and four dealing with light shine versus light directing onto. Um, and again, the light height with the shining onto kind of play hand in hand together. Kevin, how, how high is it 85 feet on sort of a stories of a building? Approximately. Seven to eight stories. Okay. Okay, any further comment from our commissioners, from our staff? Is there any public comment on this? All right, I'll call the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Passes six to one with Commissioner Kevin Higgins opposing. I move the approval of HARB 2013-1 for 206 Midland Avenue to remove existing breakfast room and add a two-story addition. Second. Any commissioner comment? Any commissioner comment about this? Any staff comment? Any public comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes seven to nothing. I move the approval of HARB 2013-2 for 319 South Wayne Avenue, first floor edition. Second. Any commissioner comment? Any staff comment? Any public comment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes seven to nothing. I move the approval of HARB 2011-17A for 200 West Wayne Avenue to demolish a one-story addition on existing structure and replace with garage and two-story addition. I'll second it. I'm going to abstain. I represented the buyer and the seller on the purchase of this property. All right. Do we have any commissioner comment? Any staff comment? <coughs> any public comment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes six to nothing with Bill Spingler abstaining. And next we move on to Public Works and Engineering with Commissioner um, Jim Higgins. Uh, the, first, the first item is um, a resolution of this Board of Commissioners to approve the final plans for the subdivision of 615 Newtown Road by the developer 615 Newtown Road Associates LP, Limited Partnership. And we have um, six conditions to the, um, six elements to the resolution, so I move its introduction and passage. I believe we have the applicant here tonight. Hello, Mr. Brosman. Good evening, you? George Brosman representing the applicant. I would like to propose, and I had sent this to John Rice, a modification to condition number three of the resolution. This has to do with lot nine, uh, the one that's across uh, Sproul Road that we spoke about at length at caucus. Um, we would like to, um, I had conversations with John Rice about what we might do with lot nine. We had offered it to the township and township was reluctant to accept. We've offered it to the Conservancy. I think they're meeting about it tonight, but I'm not optimistic they're going to take it. Um, we think another option may be the swim club that adjoins it. Um, so we had talked about, uh, John and I had, if we were to accept some sort of restriction against impervious coverage or buildings, that it could still have an advantage to the swim club if they would desire it. Uh, that even though you couldn't put anything on this lot nine, if we so restricted it, that if it could be transferred, um, it could go into their holdings and it may allow them to do something more. So I would propose adding to the end of nine, just to clarify that so it doesn't come out later as, a, as an issue, it being understood that the impervious and or building coverage allowed for lot nine under applicable ordinances 
may be allocated to and or utilized on an adjoining tract where lot nine is in common ownership with an adjacent tract. Okay. And that's uh, what we would request. And then I think we could I'll come to agreement with regard to this lot. No, okay. So if we sec accept that, you'll accept the condition? Yes. And that's just so that they could use that lot in their impervious, in their total for their impervious calculations? Yeah, all of their right. calculations, mm -hmm. basically, it would become, could become part of their lot area. Um, okay. uh, they would take it, if they take it, I'm not speaking for them, but it would be subject to the restrictions that I work out with John Rice. Right. Uh, but they uh, they could uh, put it with their other lands and uh, take advantage of whatever little potential that would have on their John, other I, lands. I'm sorry, I thought you were, that sounds reasonable to me, but I see your lights on. Do you have a... Yeah, there's a, a couple, and George and I spoke about this uh, before the meeting tonight, just a couple tweaks. He, he modified that condition, um, and I want to make sure that this land, as it gets allocated, is the properties on the same side of sprawl road as this lot because as you know all the other building lots are on the opposite side of sprawl road this is over there sitting by itself so i know the swim clubs there there may be some other properties that this could be attached to it it needs to be on that side of sprawl road and not reattached adjacently across sprawl road somehow so just to add to george's suggestion to that condition uh, the last sentence should read of condition three, any such easement or declaration um, I'm sorry, at the end of the first sentence, what should be added there and which I think George took out is that the declaration um, shall be approved in form and manner by the township solicitor. That's in the original resolution. Uh, I want to have control over the actual language of that declaration. Uh, and then the last <coughs> sentence, as George stated, uh, at the end where it says, with an adjacent tract uh, on that, on the, I don't know whether that's the north, south, east, or west side of Sprawl Road, but on the east side of Sprawl Road. So this gets attached to a piece of property on that side of Sprawl Road, not on the side of the development. I'm assuming it's going to be the swim club if, if George's negotiations are that acceptable uh, fruitful. to you, the way you described it? Yes, I didn't mean to take out the township solicitor language. So as I read it, I was just adding on to what you already had on three. So if John wants to also say at the end of what I read at the east side of Sprawl Road, that seems fine. I'll make a motion to amend this to reflect what you just described. Second. He's making a motion to amend it as described, and I'm sec or Elaine seconded it. All right, you got the wording? We've got the wording. There's another issue. Okay. Uh, there's a uh, subdivision land development waiver, which was called out by Gilmore in their letter. The resolution should specifically include that. Um, and it's referenced in the Gilmore engineering letter, but just so it's clear, it's section 255-31 cap F, which is a prohibition against grading within three feet of the property line. And we're adding that. We would add that to the approval. Kevin, resolution. will you add that to your amendment? Sure. Okay, so we have a motion, and I will second that. So we have a motion and a second for this resolution with the added language clarifying um, John Rice's language um, about the <laughs> Um, lot nine prohibition, the lot nine lot, restriction. The restriction on lot nine in addition to a waiver for the grading within three feet of the property line. So we're we all vote, clear. Why don't we vote on the two amendments and then we'll vote on the total motion. Well, I think that one motion is fine. We, we all understand what's in that motion? Okay. All right. Does anybody have any discussion about that motion? Just want to clarify. So all this is acceptable to you? Yes. All right. Do we have any staff comment about that motion? All right, any public comment? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes seven to nothing. Before we leave that matter, I'd, I'd like to, now that it's all passed and fine, you can relax. <laughs> um, I noticed in 
Mr. Broseman, in both times your client appeared before the Zoning Hearing Board, um, you were granted favorable decisions, and the hearings were on November 15th, and the opinion of the solicitor took six weeks to issue, or five weeks to issue. And Kevin, you may want to comment on this. Is this common that it takes that long? I, I know that the solicitor has to do it in draft, and it has to go to the five members, and they all have to sign off or initial it. Then it com comes back to the solicitor, and he, he then puts his, his signature on it. But do these things have to take five weeks to, because I assume the applicants are waiting for this decision before they feel safe enough to act. Yes, I would imagine that the applicants are waiting. Um, I think the, the timeline varies depending on the number of cases in front of the Zoning Hearing Board and the complexity of those cases. I can um, talk to the solicitor and um, inquire if there can be some um, speed up in, in that process. That would be helpful. John Rice, do you have any experience in your other municipalities where you serve? Uh... I mean, there, there's, there's some ways to expedite it, but the way the, the planning code is set up, the Sony Hearing Board has to hold a hearing within 60 days of the application, the first hearing. So if that, depending on the timing of the application, you've got to advertise it twice. You've got to post property, you have to send out mailings. So you have, from the date of application, 60 days to hold that first hearing. I mean, I don't know what the average is in, in, in most municipalities, but it's usually at least 30. No, no, that's not my, my days. Question. But then you have the hearing, then yeah. you have 45 days to issue the written decision. So on the back end, depending on the complexity of the application, it may take um, 30 days or so. You have to reconvene the zoning hearing board. Uh, I know some municipalities have a one-page approval letter, which they sign the night of the meeting for simple approvals. If you have a simple approval yeah. with no conditions and nobody opposing the application, some municipalities use a form which you check okay. the blocks and they walk away that night with the approval. So but anything, the, anything beyond that, you have to give reasons for your, for so your the, decision. So the, the pacing item or the outside date is stipulated or dictated by the municipality's planning code, and that's 45 days. Correct. But are you also saying that the zoning hearing board has to reconvene no. sometime after its decision to affirm its decision? No. Not, no, they, I don't believe they okay. have to. All right. I mean, once they vote, then it's up to the solicitor with okay. the board input to issue the written decision, but it's got to be signed also. By each, well, it can be signed by email today with. Correct, yeah. So it's in the good hands of our Director of Community Development to see if he can expedite the process. Yes, I will and, and have, have a conversation with him. That then there's a 30 day appeal process before you really know that you can move forward. Well, all the more reason why the solicitor ought to <laughs> issue the decision earlier than five and a half weeks yeah. after the, the hearing. Well, he does an outstanding job and I'm sure if Kevin talks to him, he'll, he'll do an even more outstanding job. It, it's, I'm not picking on Mr. Ryan because I know it's been the practice before he was appointed by our board. Well, I also want to just say thank you to the applicant for your for working with the township on the many issues that came up and um, and for your patience and, and flexibility and good luck with your project. We look forward to seeing it go up. I'm sure it's going to be beautiful. Thank you. Okay, moving on to finance and audit with Commissioner Kevin Higgins. All right, just to refresh people's memory, if anybody arrived late, item E is off the agenda, so we're proceeding to item F which is a motion to authorize the township manager to engage Phoenix advisors as a swap advisors for the township at a price not to exceed $10,000 because the swap matures or we have to make a payment in 14 months. Anything more we want to say about that, Bill? Uh, well, that, yeah, regardless of what we do, we have the option to potentially terminate that agreement prior to the execution date, which will occur next year. Uh, so anytime between now and then, uh, we are currently working with Carfac on potential options to be recommended to the board uh, but it, it seems to make sense at this point to bring an advocate on our uh, an expert who represents Radnor Township to the table now to start uh, assisting us in analyzing the numbers so that's why this is in front of the board tonight I make a motion to approve second we move to second 
Um, I did have a question. Uh, so are, do we know this refunding of the 2004 bond issue? Is that we're assuming we're, we're thinking we're going to get some savings out of that, right? Well, it depends how you define savings. The, the swap agreement itself is upside down from the mm -hmm. township's perspective where we will have to pay a termination, a fee basically to terminate the agreement. Uh, if that does not happen prior to the execution date, the option is entirely the counterparties to put us into the agreement at which time the township pays 4.81% fixed flat rate. Uh, we receive 67% of LIBOR, which right now is basically nothing. Uh, so that is added interest cost to the township. At the same time, we will have to issue variable rate bonds. Um, so we'd be paying the interest cost on the variable rate bonds. And we have to it, issue at variable rate bonds under the swap agent? Well, the only, yeah, given the, the swap and the, the way it's structured, it only makes sense to issue variable rate. If you, you, we could issue fixed rate, but we'd basically be doubling our interest cost at that point. Uh, so it totally doesn't make sense given the interest rate environment, so I just wanted to understand. Right. The potential for savings is, ba is comparing the two options. Uh, so the savings could be realized in terminating the fee now or terminating the swap agreement now, paying the fee, and then amortizing that payment along with the 04 bonds over the next, say, 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that potentially could be the cheaper option, depending on where the numbers fall out at. But and we'll get into a lot more detail about this when a recommendation ultimately comes. But uh, some of the other things associated with the variable rate bonds are the uh, massive amount of costs that bring, that come with it, uh, including buying a letter of credit for remarketing risk, as well as uh, taking on the market risk associated with the fluctuating interest rates. Uh, and for those reasons alone, it almost makes sense to, to terminate. But Ultimately, a, a, we're working with CARFAC to put a recommendation together to bring back in front of the board. And um, Phoenix Advisors, they are, they've been advising us for the last several years on how to report this and how to account for it. They, did they have any part in advising us to get into this? No. Okay. Uh, going back through the records, it was Fairmount Capital that um, the township worked with in initially entering into this agreement back in 2005. We solicited uh, when GASB 53, when we were required to report the derivative accounting uh, to meet the standards of GASB with derivative accounting, um, we solicited prices from multiple firms to help us out and Phoenix Advisor was the lowest at that time and that was three years ago and we've been working with them since. So that's how we met up with Phoenix Advisors. And uh, I got on their website today just to, you know, kind of learn a little bit about them, and I, I couldn't find any names of any principals there. I mean, it's kind of weird. <laughs> but I, do we have one person we work with? Yes, we've been, we've been working with the same name? individual. His name's Pete Egan, and we've been working okay. with him in each of the okay. years. And that's who we'd be working with under this arrangement as well. Okay. And you know what his qualifications are, his... his work history, his education and all. Um, we researched all that three years ago when we first brought Phoenix Advisors and Pete on board to help us out with our GASB disclosure. Okay. And we've been Please. satisfied with their work and... Yes, mm -hmm. annually their work has been accurate and on time. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, that was moved by Kevin Higgins. Who seconded that? I seconded. You oh. did, Bill? Okay, do we have any other commissioner comment or questions on this? Any other staff comment? Any public comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes seven to nothing. Next item on the agenda is introduction of ordinance 2013-02, uh, amending chapter 260, articles two and three. Oops, I missed one, sorry about that. Resolution 2013-20, amending the township's 2013 salary and wage schedule and organizational chart. Uh, Bob or Bill, you just want to explain quickly the three changes? Sure. Uh, with regard to Resolution 2013-17, which is on tonight's agenda a little bit later on, it calls for the establishment of a supervisor of parking and auxiliary services position. So to the extent a salary needs to be established for that position, that's one of the items identified within this resolution, as well as the 
there was a, an agreement with the, one of the code officials for a, a wage adjustment earlier this year. This is going back in um, amending the, fee, the salary schedule to reflect that change. And then finally to uh, make the necessary changes in the township's organizational chart that was approved by the board previously to reflect the new position as well as uh, clean up a couple other positions that have either gone vacant or have been, uh, the decision was made not to fill, including the part-time HR manager, the economic development manager position, and then ultimately, uh, finally, uh, moving the engineering inspection officer from community development over to public works where the engineering department is or the responsibilities are housed. So I make a motion to approve resolution 2013-20. Second. Any commissioner, any commissioner comment on that? Uh, Bob, do we have the individuals named, uh, identified at this point, who will be the supervisor? Not at this time. It's currently being posted, so not yet. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the commissioners? Uh, this is 2013-20? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other staff comment? Any public comment on this? Come up. Yes, come up to the mic. Give us your name and your um, what part of the township you live in. James Holt, 425 Darby Paley Road. Was there a handout on this? I wasn't able to find it on the table. Uh, well, it should have been. I, I believe it was in the packet that was posted online. Um, so it should be over there. I actually saw it online, so I. I'll Did take you? a look at it. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay. Any other public comment? All right. I'll call the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes seven to nothing. All right. The next item on the agenda is Ordinance 2013-02. It's the introduction and it amends Chapter 260, Articles 2 and 3 of the Township Code to include fees associated with the collection and administration of the Act 511 taxes. So, Bill, this is essentially that when we have somebody that's either delinquent or, or we're in a dispute, we're able to charge them uh, the fees associated with the process in addition to the taxes and the interest associated with the late payments. Is that accurate? That's yes. And with the intention being of shifting the burden of paying for the costs associated with the legal services uh, onto the delinquent taxpayer rather than um, either absorbing those through the interest and penalty that is associated with being delinquent or just the general tax uh, Revenue. Make a motion to approve. Second. Any, uh, Any commissioner comment? Uh, I did have. Um, I, I mean, is this a common practice in most townships? They that this, these costs are passed on in this sort of delinquency. Yeah. Yes. 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 And um, I was thinking through how this might work, and you know, a lot of these things are settled. Yeah. So, is this something that is? Once the settlement is achieved, this would be tacked on ahead of it, or has this become part of your settlement discussion? Yeah. Part it, of the settlement yeah, discussion. Yeah, this would be part of it. I mean, this, this is a number that would go into that discussion right. in lieu of going through the whole legal process. Uh -huh. so, okay. Yeah. It, right. it will encourage um, settlement and maybe settlement at a higher number. Correct. Because you're going to be able to calculate it. You need to adopt an ordinance that authorizes this in order to you had to follow it through mm -hmm. there's been a few court cases that have challenged these types of fees so you don't have anything currently on the books for this or for the next ordinance okay, okay. Um, unfortunately it may reduce uh, billable hours by attorneys so that may be the downside <laughs> to that all right do we have any other commissioner comments or questions any staff comment one one just one mm -hmm. comment um, section four um, should read and it's the, the language is in the next your ordinances sh should read the ordinance shall become effective in accordance with the home rule charter of Radnor Township uh, okay. which has a specific provision regarding effective date of ordinances um, which is different than what's in the BPT ordinance so with that with okay. that change just to be consistent with our ordinances well, I guess, Kevin, do you want to amend your... Uh, I'll make that... Uh, to reflect change. that language. Yep. Second. And I guess, Bob, uh, John, when we get to the next one, the same issue applies? No, I did that one. I okay. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, so we have a motion and a second for that, this resolution as amended with that new language. Any other commissioner comment or staff comment? Any public comment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes seven to nothing. Next item on the agenda is ordinance 2013-03, uh, amending chapter 260, article six of the township code, uh, including the fees for collection, this time of local services tax taxes. So it's essentially the same thing, only a different provision of taxes, correct, Bill? That is correct, yes. Okay, I make a motion to approve. Second. All right, do we have any more comment on this? Any staff comment? Any public comment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes seven to nothing. Next we, Manager, yep. Before we leave the subject of tax, uh, Act 511. Before we leave the subject of Act 511 taxes, I, uh, Bob, we've, I've discussed with you in the past how we might do a better job of identifying more of the businesses that operate in Radnor Township uh, that should be paying any of these taxes. And uh, is it possible that we could start doing some um, assaying or assessments or investigations of okay. um, organizations that are in the township that are not filing and we don't have in our database? Yes, Commissioner. Based on a previous recommendation that you made to us, uh, we are looking at right now uh, either a intern possibly doing this, a part-time staff person, or bringing on a third party to look at this and be able to go through the entire inventory of the entire township to make sure that everybody is contributing towards this particular program. That's a, that's a big undertaking. I mean, it's it, visiting lots and lots of buildings. It is, Commissioner, and we hope to have some type of recommendation to you very soon uh, to one of the Board of Commissioners meetings here okay. for you to address that issue for you. Thank you. Okay, Madam, Madam President, if I, if, if I just add real quickly to that, just to, I don't want anyone to, to, to walk away with the impression that that is not going on currently. There is a, a fair amount of uh, resources out in the community now with our, our auditor that we hire and through the resources that we have available to us. What we've, based on the recommendation from this board and working through CARFAC, what we're doing is looking to bring on additional help to go into the areas where we find it difficult to get the information to to make sure that we're getting a higher percentage of compliance. So I, I just didn't want anyone to think that it's not going on now, which it is. It's an effort. I mean, it's not a we're going to get you effort. It's a, it's a question of fairness in that, you know, many, most businesses are paying this tax and it's unfair to those who, uh, to those who are paying that their competitors may not be. Okay, let's move on to public safety and Commissioner Spingler will take. Yes, I'd like to uh, introduce Ordinance 2013-04, amending Chapter 130 of the Code of the Township of Radnor, establishing a new stop intersection at Midland Avenue and St. David's Road. Second. All right, do we have any commissioner comment about this? And do we have any staff comment? Do we have any public comment? Okay, I'll call the vote. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes seven to nothing. That's it under public safety. Well, 15 years and it was a two minute vote. What's that? <laughs> 15 years in the making, <laughs> that vote. It's a whole different board. <laughs> okay, moving on to parks and recreation with Commissioner Nagel. I'd like to uh, move resolution 2012-23 authorizing township to approve recreation and community programming department usage of Radnor Township School District facilities for the youth basketball winter 2012-13 season. Uh, this is dictated because it will exceed $3,000. Second. All right, do we have any commissioner comment about this? <coughs> Resolution? Any staff comment? Any public comment? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes seven to nothing. Next, I'd like to move resolution 2013-24, authorizing the township to enter into agreement with David Broida for the winter tennis lessons, uh, not to exceed 6,000. Again, this is greater than $3,000 required by charter. Second. Any commissioner comment? Any staff comment? Any public comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 
Passes seven to nothing. And last is um, resolution 2013-25, amendment to the township's consolidated fee schedule under Parks and Rec, and this is to uh, incorporate Memorial Field, which we had not previously included. Second. Is, is that accurate? Because it says here the, the, the fee was $200 already incorporated. So is that description accurate, Tammy? Well, the, the fee was incorporated into the, the 2013 consolidated fee schedule as it was approved by the board. Uh, but I, I do want to point out that in the lease, uh, there is a later statement within the actual lease, the ordinance lease itself, that states that the township does have the uh, discretion to set that fee accordingly. And I want to revert back to that in order to be able to set that fee and change that fee. So, uh, and I have a question, Tammy. I didn't, I didn't really have an issue with the 60 to 75 but what was the logic for reducing from 200 to 150 the fee for the for-profit businesses and the non-resident groups? To be able to encourage the usage of the field. Uh, at this time, uh, a lot of those groups have been the ones who have been requesting the field, and I felt that that fee was cost prohibitive and wanted to reduce that to something that would be a little less restrictive in our ability to be able to rent the field and still be able to cover the associated costs that we put forth to, to be able to manage the field, essentially. So, so have they said they don't want to do it at $200? I would say overall, groups who have inquired for usage of the field, uh, whether they're private business or any type of a private school, uh, they have balked at the fee as it had been set. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments? Any other staff comment? Any public comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes seven to nothing. And we will move on to personnel and administration with Commissioner Fisher. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have Crescent Partners come up and give us a presentation, uh, an update on the real estate assessment. I think they're going to head up now. And if, if you can, please uh, reintroduce yourselves. Uh, it's been Hi, a I'm Adrian from Cressa. I'm actually just going to switch out the presentation. We found a small typo right before we got here. So. Isn't that always the way? Yeah, well, <laughs> it was a small, it was a one missing, but makes a big number difference. So. <laughs> and I'm Dick Stanton with Cressa. Yeah, and I'm a... Uh, Excuse me, Greg Fisher with Cressa. Welcome. Thanks for coming again. We're going to walk. <clears throat> we're going to walk through, uh, you know, the presentation that really talks about report step one, step two, step three. In uh, <clears throat> 2010, uh, the uh, Citizens Financial Group put, uh, was appointed by the board to, to look into options for uh, making up for a deficit. In, in the budget. One of the recommendations was to sell some properties to fix that deficit problem. The, um, the township realized after that that, uh, that there was a need to look at all the properties and determine uh, are the records straight <clears throat> and are there options uh, if, if needed to, to uh, monetize some of the assets. So they went out for an RFP to, uh, to, uh, to see if those sorts of services are available. And they asked us, we were retained, and they asked us to really do three things. To look at uh, the uh, property use and, uh, and the deed restrictions on all the properties, to see if the records are straight on all the properties, and then to evaluate options to monetize it. So we, we found 69 parcels uh, that were contained within 42 properties and we're going to walk through uh, those properties. <clears throat> Again, uh, the 
Step one was uh, really to, to, to identify, uh, set up a record of all the properties and uh, locations of the properties and the zoning of the properties. And, and, in, and in step one, which, uh, I mean, uh, report one, which was already provided, it, it defined the location for each property. We also, during that process, looked at 425 easements uh, that were established with uh, residents to, to have access to their property. There, there's a, a bigger version of this list uh, in, the, in the property you were given. Right. So in step two of the report that was done in September of last year, uh, we put together a property record for each property, <clears throat> and we put together a report on uh, the discrepancies uh, that were uh, associated with each property. There's, there's some examples here, and again, there's a property record in the document you received. So for all 42 properties, there, there's a complete record on uh, when the property was obtained, who was obtained from the price, the zoning, uh, any de deed restrictions on the property, how many parcels are on the property, and, uh, and there's a visual of, of that property. And there is a complete list of, of a number of corrections, corrective actions that really need to be taken on properties like the Young Track, the properties like uh, Ordovicio, Cowan Park, <coughs> the stormwater pumping stations, uh, and, uh, and uh, the public works, uh, the parcels that should be combined into one, and they're all in that report. I'd rather not, if you want to go into any details on, on discrepancies, we'll do that. They're all in the report. Uh, what we said was we would work with, uh, with a solicitor to help him get all those through the county records. But if you have any questions at all on any of the properties or any of the discrepancies. Well, are there aren't any new ones from the time that you finished? No. no. Okay. But I thought my interest Sure. I just wanted to highlight that the discrepancies to which Greg refers are really errors in record keeping at the county level and not at the township level. <laughs> so. The next step was really to, to, to delve into each property. So all parcels <clears throat> were evaluated and separated really into five groups. Uh, you know, the first group are well-maintained, uh, utilized uh, parks and open space that, uh, that you know, we believe, given, given that fact, uh, there was no further evaluation required. So what was identified in those property reports, we, we believe, there's no need to go into further options on those properties. And those are the 14 properties you see identified there. There were also six functionally adequate uh, facilities, like the library, uh, that, that also were uh, fully used. And we felt, uh, uh, given that fact, there was no further evaluation needed. But there were 18 underutilized parks, and there were four underutilized facilities uh, so there's tw there's 20 in that first group, 22 in the second group. The 22, we're going to get into detail tonight on which one of them's and the options on those properties. Could you just align your terminology for a minute? Sure. H is high, well utilized, maintained? Yeah, I'm going to show that in the next page. Okay. Uh, but but there are also 13 properties where there are use or deed restrictions, and uh, th they are included in those 42 properties. And as we walk through. Uh, you'll, you'll see what those restrictions are. So what, what we did is I, I, we worked with Park and Recreation and the Public Works Department to try to try to look at active utilization of parks. Now, obviously, there's a lot of passive utilization of parks. Uh, and where we couldn't put an hour, a uh, number of hours, man hours to maintain or hours in terms of utilizing the park, uh, working with Parks and Recreation, we uh, made a determination as to they were passive, but they were low passive use. An example might be Skunk Hollow. We originally had, there were no active use out there, but you're right, there is a lot of people walking on the trails, but we can't put anything other than the fact that it's a low utilization of a 97 acre parcel. So, 
We, we, uh, we separated, uh, first of all, the park utilization into high use, 1,000 uh, plus hours a year, uh, moderate use, 300 to 1,000, uh, less than 200 was, uh, was low utilization, and then some, there are a number of properties, as you as will see as we walk through, there were no utilization. And in terms of uh, parks and recreation, <coughs> excuse me, there are about 600 plus hours a year was considered high maintenance, uh, and the moderate maintenance was three to 600, and then uh, low maintenance was, was 200. So we separated them out. We call this a call metrics. What's Carl's last name? Uh, but he, he gave us the idea that we, we had presented in a line before. He says you're better off running a metric. So the properties above that line, uh, the eight, uh, you'll see uh, 14 of them plus six facilities, we felt were, there were no need to move them forward. Uh, but the properties below, with the exception of the four that are uh, restri have restrictions on it, so there's 18 there. You know, we believe that you needed further evaluation of it, and that's what we did. Are you happy with that? The way we broke those out? Yeah, I, I think I understand. So, for example, I'm looking at the table. Warren Philippone says high utilization, high maintenance. So that's one of the four that's up in the upper right one corner. One of those four is not upper okay. right. And Ithin Valley, which is low and low would be one of the six in the blue. Low and lower the six in the middle. Right. I mean, a, a couple of quick examples. Moderate with high utilization. I just want to correlate what's on this table right. to what's on the grid. Right. Yes. Okay. And, and how did you make a determination as to what the utilization was? From uh, either parks and recreation in terms of permits to use the park and from public works in terms of man hours to maintain the property cutting grass, taking care of the leaves, the, you know, cutting the trees. But if, if there was a park or a property that didn't require a permit to use, it was, it, you would just have to rely it either, on... It was either no utilization, or if we could determine there was passive utilization, it was passive but low. And you just have to rely on Mr. Kochansky or Ms. Cohen to determine right. how many people were using those properties? I mean, you know, there are ways to go out. It wasn't in our scope to go out and try to set up a metering system to determine who might just walk on the property. So in order to separate them out, are they being used? We went to the experts who are Parks and Recreation and Public Works. They, they, they maintain permits on all the parks. Again, what we were trying to do is separate out, are, are there parks and are there open space parcels that are utilized, and the best way to do it is, 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 is through their mechanism. Right. But for example, Sawmill Park, you have park utilization low. It is low. How, how, and how did you determine that? Uh, you know, from, from uh, Parks and Recreation and from, you know, it's part of the walking trail through Skunk Hollow, and so there's passive trail use out there. But, but there's another point to Sawmill. Sawmill it has a, uh, a creek going right through it, so it's, so it's a flood zone. Yeah, so every time I drive past Sawmill, there's cars. There's like six or eight cars every time parked. Well, that, uh, during fishing season, there are uh, thousands even of this, people. Even this past right? weekend, so, <laughs> but, so but there, I'm trying to understand how you made a determination that it's low. Get to the final, what, what, what are we trying to solve? We're not trying to determine exactly how many people are in each park. It's, have we, is a park utilized to a point where there's no sense looking at other options for that park? Sawmill is one of them. Kevin, I think on this part of this is their assessment is of the real estate side. So based on this is either through observations, through recreation, or observations through public works, which now take care of the parks. It's through their observations. Is it 100% scientific? No. So that's it's the based on basically observations. Basically, if they didn't have an ability to measure it, somebody gave an opinion. Correct. Okay. Well, we, what we did was there are things that we could objectify, which are uses that were performed through an active permit that they were applied for through Parks and Rec or another township body. Um, but there are other uses that we cannot objectify, that passive use. We don't know how many people were walking their dog in a park. We don't know how many people went out after dinner to have a catch in the park. But we know that you know, following this discussion, you guys will have some knowledge of these things, and you'll be able to apply that subjective knowledge to your deliberations about the use of each of these properties. See, again, we were. 
we had three tasks. The one task was was to uh, review and identify ownerships and any problems with the ownerships, and that was in the reports. The second task was to look at the use and to look at the cost to maintain the parks, and, and then and then to separate out so uh, to, so that we can get, you know, the third task was was to evaluate options to monetize. Well, those parks above that line, there's really not sense in trying to, op to look at options to monetize it because you're not going to monetize it. So we were just looking at underutilized uh, or, and or underutilized and high maintenance properties that could be monetized if you wanted to monetize them. So that's what we did. Can I add something here too? And also, with respect to this, you know, we didn't look at only opportunities to monetize. We're presenting options to you, not recommendations tonight. And some of the things that we found were opportunities where you might be able to find ways to increase utilization of these parks in their current state. But maybe, you know, there's not enough parking or there's not enough access and ways that we could actually, you know, have that low increase quite a, quite a lot. So you may find that, you know, you may take out of this, you find some things that you want to monetize, you may find some things where you want to do little projects that will actually increase your utilization of your open space. So mind if I ask a question about this sure. image? Are you, um, are you indicating that those blue colored are undesirable? I mean, to me, I would look at that and interpret that, that our usage is appropriate in that no, our we're not, we didn't we didn't get into undesirable undesirable properties what we got into was properties that were utilized and properties that are underutilized very well then inefficient are you looking at blue as inefficient it, we, and that's you mean blue you're talking about bottom left that, yes that yeah what well, if if they're if they're underutilized properties that that uh, that, that they were not restricted by either a deed or a use or, or, or a, uh, you know, a wetlands area. Then we looked at could they be, you know, utilized better, or could they be monetized if they couldn't be utilized better? Right. But, but, well, but, can I make so, a comment well, about this just, Let me finish table? and then you can. Okay, so, because the well, interpretation is the opposite of yeah, what you're going at. They're going or I'm going. That you're going. Well, the, let me say what the, I think the interpretation is and then you can. I, I look at this and I see efficiency in it. I see the the low use being low cost and the high use being high cost. So I would look at that and I would see, I would see efficiency and say that's not good. I wouldn't look at those blue ones and say those are problematic. I would we, look at those blue ones and say that again, we that's didn't, appropriate. Again, we didn't make a judgment on the properties. What we said was the, the properties in the green were fully utilized so that there's no sense going in detail about how do you okay. optimize them. Very well. So, so I guess the key is it isn't utilization to me that is the, the metric. To me, it's the efficiency of the utilization. I look at that and see efficiency, and the fact that it's underutilized is, is mitigated by the fact that it's low cost. Well, why don't, why don't, let, let us walk through some of the properties, and, and then you'll see how we separated them out. Can I just make a, a brief comment? What I'm getting from this, this is a pretty common analysis uh, 3D graph uh, chart. It's the lower right-hand qu quadrant here that has that shows you that the park maintenance is high, but the utilization is low. That's that's not that's the outlier. That's the one we want to look at. For me, that's the one I want to look at. I want to know either can we reduce our maintenance on that or you raise utilization to move that those two parcels either up to the upper right hand quadrant or the lower left right i think you're saying the same thing i'm saying that the, the efficiency <laughs> is along that that axis of blue to green yeah. it, if, you, if you can look at two properties you have two parcels there where you have low usage high cost st david's and the radnor nature trail Low utilization, but high cost to maintain. So we did look at those to say, what are the options to reduce the cost or incre increase utilization? Uh, you know, so, but, but that's, how, that's how we looked at it. We, we, we had no judgments as we went through the properties. We just said, are they fully utilized or not? And if they're not, what can be done about it? Bob, can I ask on the 
Radnor Nature Park, was that measured when we were still in the cross maintenance agreement? Because I can't believe no. the. No. No. Does it really take that much time and effort to make it? It does. Okay. See, I mean, the problem with, with that particular park, since you asked, is that there's a restriction on the park. Actually, there's two. One is to get to it, you go to a private road. But, but, the, but it's right behind the, the elementary school. And the restriction is nobody can use it when the elementary school is in session. So, that, so because of that, you don't get a whole lot of use of that park. I'm trying to understand the, the 746 maintenance hours, if that's what MH, I assume that's what MH means. Nan hours. Seems an awful lot for that small piece relative to some of the others I'm looking on here. So that's what just confused me. Well, I mean, it's, it is used by the school district. Kids get out there and play. But, uh, you know, it wasn't used by the, the citizens. They're citizens. Okay, so let's move on and start going through some okay, of these so properties. Okay, so then, you know, now we're looking at 22 properties we will evaluate in detail. And uh, so we divided these up into those, for simplicity, hopefully, those that are related to the school district. There's a number of properties uh, like Tenel. It's it's uh, it's listed as um, it's listed as a moderate use, high maintenance. But the township owns the entry to, to Tunnel Park. The school district owns Tunnel Park. The township maintains Tunnel Park. So, <clears throat> uh, and, and I guess, and you, you know, somebody probably could, knows more than I, but when the school, when there was a middle school close to Tunnel, it was used substantially by the school district. And now it's used more by, uh, not the school district, by, but by residents who book it. But the, but the township owns the park. School district owns the entry to the park. Yeah, uh, vice versa. Yeah, I'm the, the other way around. So our recommendation was, or I mean our option was, to either deed the, to the township parcel to the school district, or you could, you know, work with the school district to have them deed the property to the township, who maintains it and uses it. And, uh, you know, there's no discussion of monetization of those parks. It's a park that's being used. It's, it's who owns the park. Radnor da Nature Trail, we, we spoke shortly about. The use, dis uh, the use restrictions are associated with it being behind the middle of the uh, grammar school. So uh, you could either deed the park to the school district uh, to reduce your maintenance or, or, or build them for your maintenance or you're going to explore options to increase utilization of the park. Uh, and then the, uh, there's a middle school parking lot on the Wella that's really used by the school district. Township owns the property. Township maintains that uh, parking lot. So again, you can deed the parking lot to the school district to reduce your maintenance costs ch or charge them for that maintenance or uh, lease, lease the parking lot to the school district to offset the maintenance costs. Don't we lease that to the business community, the township? Uh, there's no record of that. No, Bob, don't we lease, don't we lease the Luella parking spots to the business community? We do. The ones on the field oh, side. The ones on the field, field side, side of Luella Avenue, they're set aside per, right, for the business permit. community. Permits, right? Yeah, the permit. But yes, Commissioner, a, a certain number of permits are leased, yes. Mm -hmm. But that whole section is leased to the business community. No one else can park there unless you have a permit. That is correct. That we issue. Right. Yes. Right. Do we charge for those permits? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll correct that in here because we found no record of that. Uh, the next three are... Uh, the next uh, two, the first two... Uh, West Beach Tree Lane, or it's, it's also called Marysville Park, is the access to North Wayne Field. Now that is actively uh, utilized by the middle school for ball, 
uh, baseball. But the, uh, the, the field, again, is maintained by the township. So, you know, the, the option is just, you know, and I suppose there could be too, the option is to deed that property to the school district since they are actively using the ball field or, or to charge them for, for uh, maintaining their ball field. I noticed that in the report. Um, I, I mean, when my kids were young, we, that's where Little League played as well. Is that not the case anymore, Tammy? Little League doesn't use that field anymore? Little League does still use it, but uh -huh. they're definitely not the predominant user. It is Radnor Middle School, mm -hmm. basically for soccer uh, in the fall, and then they use it for baseball, of course, um, in the spring, and it does account for the majority of the hours by the school's usage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the last one associated with the school district is so, so PCO Gym. Um, the options there is to negotiate a, a deed agreement with the school district uh, for the property, 100 year ground lease at a, at a dollar. Or you could uh, <clears throat> construct a new uh, public gym on a uh, on another township site complex here uh, and, and then give that property the gym back to the school district uh, you know and really that's the last one return the building to the school district the next group of about four or five properties are small <clears throat> locations that are not utilized the first one is the Sproul Road uh, the recommendation there is really to explore options to increase utilization of that property. It is near a, a stream that goes through there. It could be, there is a retention pond on the property. It could be used as part of the stormwater management system. It's not now. Uh, the other option is to monetize it. It's not being used and it is uh, maintained. Uh, the uh, value of that property is not substantial. It's 125000 yeah, we paid 70000 so they wouldn't build a house on that corner. And, you know, you have to remember there is a concept called open space. Right. Where you just buy land and leave it alone. You don't do anything with it. You don't maintain it. You know, you just, and that's, you know, that's what that property was purchased for, just open space, never to be utilized. Well, then I would, you know, if, if these are, we're, we're just presenting yeah. options. Yeah. If that's the option you choose, then I would increase the utilization of it. Yeah. Yeah, it might be, Bill, that um, it, it will service for stormwater management within the next several years. Well, the, the creek's downhill, but I guess you could put something on there to hold water, you know. Yeah, you can pump it. So your, this assessment that if we put on market, it would, um, you know, there would be a market. I mean, the fact that you mon you've given a monetary, you feel that somebody would buy that parcel for residential development? Uh, for 125000 mm -hmm. And for that number, you might want to pick option one. Mm -hmm. Is this the southwest corner of Sproul and? Yeah, it's where Sproul and Conestoga and Spring Mill all come together. If you, underneath, were, if you go underneath, for, uh, the, yeah. if you're, there's a property on the other side. It used to be a garage. Yeah. And it's for sale. So it's on the other side of the, is that 476? Yeah, you go across Sproul Road, <clears throat> go across Sproul Road, and you can take a left-hand turn I'm, wait, I'm sorry, you're on Conestoga, you can take a left hand on Sprawl, or you can take a left hand turn on South Spring Mill, it's that corner. Okay. So, so the next uh, three option, uh, three properties <clears throat> are golf track. Uh, there's really no, the only, the only true access to golf track is, uh, is off the uh, Radnor Trail. Um, you know, it has a, it's a and, it, and it's not being utilized, it's not being maintained. <clears throat> so the one option is to explore options uh, to, to, for an active park uh, tied into the, to the uh, Radnor Trail or to the adjacent, since it's adjacent to and connected to uh, the other properties here and, uh, and the Capelli uh, Range. You could tie it all together. That's a, that's one option. Is the annual cash flow the maintenance cost savings, or is it something? The annual different? cash flow is uh, maintenance cost savings. Yes, uh, and and it could be managed. Uh, ma the maintenance costs plus, if you sell a property 
any, uh, you know, rent on the property, any uh, taxes on the property. The property was purchased. Uh, looking to the future, if we ever extend the P&W Trail to put a parking lot and access to the P&W Trail, that's why that property was mm -hmm. purchased. But anyway, that, that, those are the op uh, options on that one. It, the next one is a leaming track, which is right off of four, six, uh, 620. The only real access, supposedly there was an access coming in Chew Lane, but uh, you, you'd have to walk in there. Yeah, park, yeah I'm sorry, the leaning product was the one we bought for the access. The golf track we just bought for open space because it, it was adjacent to the trail and it was a wet area and we just didn't want four or five houses built there. And that you, was just to buy it as open space and we have no maintenance at that property at all. No, there is maintenance at that property. Because there's, it's, it's been, uh, if you drive up uh, Lancaster and turn right into the property. I mentioned golf. Oh, golf. Yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no maintenance on that property. But Leeming, there is maintenance on it. You can drive into it, but there's no place to really stop or park, or there's no, there's no recreational activities in there. Uh, it does have fairly high value, 880,000. Um, so what, what's the history on the Leaming Track? The Leaming Track was uh, purchased. Uh, they were going to build seven houses there, come out right at the Blue Route. Nobody really liked that. And Hank Mahoney led the battle to, to buy this so that we could have, uh, when we extend the trail, we could have easy access to the trail and put a parking lot there for people this end of the township. Uh, yeah, I mean, if and when we, we do extend the trail and if it connects to, you know, a larger trail going all the way south, we're going to need more parking. That little Conestoga parking lot is not going to cut it. Um, so this is a piece of property that would provide that if and when that happens. It may not happen for 10 years, but in 10 years, if this is sold, we're going to be buying property <laughs> for parking for the trail that we've just created. So, Madam President, if I may, maybe if it's possible, we can go through this because I'm, I'm sure that we could probably debate all these. And I know John had a good suggestion there, probably sitting down with Bill and getting some you know, history on this and maybe John Nagel and other commissioners, some of the history behind these, because I think we could probably be here to, and not that I'm trying to shortcut the meeting, we can stay till midnight, but I think trying to debate all these, I think this is, the report is to be given to the board, but yeah. there's definitely follow-up conversation that has to take place where you'll actually get into each one of these particular ones. So that would be my suggestion to the board is let, if possible, Crescent can present all this and then this is going to take a while to be able to get through this then going through each one if that would be acceptable to the board. That's fine. That's okay. fine. The, the last one on this list, the young, the young track, uh, before any, you know, the track, there, there's a parcel of land down there that's, uh, <coughs> it's about six acres. I mean, the, 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 the property is six acres. The parcel set up by the, uh, the, the county is three acres. But any, the only record we can find is that the township only owns one half an acre. Uh, so the first activity that needs to be done, and, and it's listed in, in, that, in, the, in the property records uh, recommendations, is, is it uh, explore the records uh, you know, and determine exactly how much of that uh, they own. It appears that they own more than, uh, than a half acre, but we can't determine for, of anything but that half acre. So, assuming that's done first, then you could explore options to uh, uh, for recreational use of of the of uh, three acres or six acres. You're not, not going to get much out of a half acre, uh, and and the value of that half acre is forty nine thousand. The value of the three acres would be about two hundred and ninety five, three hundred thousand, and the value of the six acres would be about uh, six hundred thousand. If you wanted, if you wanted to uh, uh, monetize that asset, the the, the next three, uh, see, as, as we go along, they, they get simpler to, to discuss. Uh, Fifth Ward Park, you know, it's a designated wetlands. Uh, you really can't do much on that property. So the options are really to ex explore options. <clears throat> it is the uh, Darby Creek goes right through it. And so stormwater management <clears throat> is an option. The other option is to, uh, to set up a place to park uh, and add a trail through it. Uh, because right now there is, you can park right on Bremore, but it's not the safest place in the world to pull a car over. 
and there's really no trails through that property. But, but there, Skunk Hollow, um, part of Skunk Hollow is also a designated wetlands which restricts, uh, you know, the, any activity around that wetlands, which is really, you know, so many feet on either side of the uh, Darby Creek that goes through it. The other problem with, uh, with Skunk Hollow, it was purchased with Project 70 money, so any request to change part or of, of that park would have to go to uh, Harrisburg <coughs> to get approval. <coughs> but there still are options to uh, increase active utilization and walking trails and even explore other recreational activities as an example and equestrian uh, uh, complex in there which could generate uh, funds for the, for the uh, uh, township. Um, the other, another option is public works could be moved to the north east side of the property uh, where uh, a lot of the um, refuse uh, work is done now. The, the, and then the other, the other option is to monetize a, a small part of the property that's it's in the uh, on the top by sawmill. It's flat land up there, but again, uh, you'd have to go to Harrisburg to get approval to do that. Because of that, we didn't list any uh, potential values because you may never get it out of Harrisburg. The last property is a, is a Chew tract, uh, which it which is a an accessible tract, even though it's it's uh, blocked on three sides by the high speed rail. The, the SEPTA 5, R5, <clears throat> and the 476. But uh, they're, they're, the one option is to ex explore options for uh, recreational use. Uh, it, public works could clearly fit on a part, part of that. Public works in these three acres, that's almost eight acre parcel. And you could explore op options to monetize it. Uh, and the value is about $2 million. Radnor Township office, it's one third utilized. Uh, the, the, the one option is to explore, uh, uh, to consolidate the township offices from the second floor to the first floor, lease out the second floor, and that's about $238,000 in uh, annual rent. Uh, you, you, could, you could bring the Wayne Senior Center onto the second floor. Uh, you're probably not going to get 238,000 annual rent from them. Uh, the other option is to, is to lease out the entire complex for about 810,000 a year, but then you'd have to look at build or lease a new township center. Um, you could also you could also evaluate uh, bringing other township activities to this site or to the adjacent properties like. Uh, the golf track or the Yankee Park or even, even Capelli. Uh, this property, and that's where you'll see in your records there a small one-digit mistake. The, 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 uh, no, actually, this, this is fine. The potential value of this property is $10.5 million. Um, the next one down is uh, St. David's Community Park. Low active utilization. I think the records are six hours a year. High maintenance costs. Uh, you could explore options to increase utilization of, of the park. I mean, the problem with the park is there's no the park. You'd have to park out on Midland and walk in. You can't park on Lancaster. Uh, so you could monetize this property. It's a it's a and and the value of it is a 1.25 million dollars. The Capella Golf Range, again, uh, low active utilization, uh, proper term would be to say low passive because it's really walk on to, to hit balls out there. <clears throat> and it's, uh, you know, you could, it also could be utilized, you know, in addition to the other township properties uh, for things like athletic fields. Uh, if you wanted to use Anki Park for for uh, for more township based, or you could explore options to monetize the asset, <clears throat> and you could get somewhere close to 3.4 million dollars from the asset. Public Works is 
is sitting in an area that's well utilized, but it's not the most effective use of that piece of property. It's tough to get on and off that site. There's one way in and out. So <clears throat> one recommendation is to move public works to either somewhere around this site, Skunk Hollow, or the Chew property, or you could probably put it on, uh, on the uh, Young property. But then you're driving off township property and around onto township property. You could explore options to lease uh, the property to a developer for something like a parking structure. So the township owns the land and, and could share in the profits of, of the parking structure. Actually, two townships have done that already, uh, Conchahawken and uh, uh, um, what's, what? Westchester. And it works. The, you know. So that, that property is worth about $1.8 million. But again, but access. The, um, the, you're, you're talking about the problem here being access. It is. Both and, on and off. Yeah. You can't turn left. You have to turn right. But it's only, only. It's our trucks and our employees that are inconvenienced by that. Right? I think the point is that it's not necessarily safe, especially for the trucks to be yeah. trying, especially if they have to go left to get somewhere. It's very difficult. As you know, the traffic mm -hmm. is very high in that retail district all day long. And for them to get out safely is not easy. Those trucks are very large. They move very slowly, especially when they're starting. And you know, you really need a, a very large opening in the traffic on both yeah. sides for them to get out going left. And a sizable opening even just to turn right. Well, in 1989 and 90, we built that, that facility. It was actually replaced one that was already there. And we had to take, um, conde we didn't condemn, but we negotiated buyouts of five property owners. Right. Yes. And we looked for other sites in the township, and Skunk Hollow was one. And the commissioner at the time, George Amon, said there was absolutely no way they, the residents in that part of the township would ever tolerate uh, having a public works operation involving trash uh, over, over that way because of, the, because of the use of the roads and the trucks going back and forth. So ultimately, we just said let's, it made sense to keep the garage right where it was. Well, and that was a long time ago. You have a very large almost industrial type use going on in Skunk Hollow right now on a portion of it. And if you were to expand the public works aspect over there, it also gives you a really good opportunity to increase utilization of, this, of the park by increasing the parking available to the public at the same time. Right now in that park, you have two basic points of access if you're going to drive to it. First is through the willows and you have to walk across that 40 acres. The other is through Sawmill Park, where there's only, I believe, 13 parking spaces. So your access to that 90-plus acre parcel is very, very limited throughout the year. There's poor, there is a smaller parking lot off Darby Paoli Road that's open certain months of the year, but not the entire year. So if you were to relocate public works there, expand the parking, it gives people far more access to park, and then you can extend the trails to so there. You may find your lower utilization of that large park increasing dramatically, which is a huge win for the residents. I think we would come out ahead on costs if we put this up for sale, put, put the Cromer Road uh, property up for sale or lease, and we'd have to build a new facility over in Skunk Hollow. We'd come out ahead? We did not do estimates on construction costs. But, but we know that <clears throat> There's a lot, there would be a lot of interest in the public works property now. And you could lease the property rather than sell it. But, um, I mean, there is, you know, there, there is a chew lot too, which is accessed both ways right off, off Lancaster. And that's a 7.5 acre untouched piece of property back in there. Okay. The, uh, The next one is Willows. Uh, you know, it's, th this is one where we made a small typo in the present value. It's not one million, it's 11 million. 
But uh, <clears throat> the options to explore uh, <clears throat> renovations uh, to, to increase community utilization of that property or explore an events management firm to increase utilization, uh, you know, or to lease or sell uh, the property to an events development to monetize the assets. You, know, you could you could maintain lease the property and have an events person go get on there and and, and uh, utilize the property. The uh, next one on is uh, is Wayne Senior Center. High utilization, but it's in a facility that that needs to be needs to have modifications done to it to improve functionality. It is right next to the Wayne train station. It's an ideal location for a couple things. You know, you, you could take the senior center and put, move it into another township building. Uh, you could move it into this building. And, and, but you could e use that for retail. You could use that for parking meters. And the value is 450000 And uh, so, again, the, the estimated value is in total. Not that we're recommending you sell any properties, thirty-three million dollars. But you, you, you could tie two properties together: St. David's and Public Works, St. David's and Chew, St. David's and Capilli, for forty-five million dollars, if you needed it for a budget. So you have the project, the report one, two, and three. This is really just a summary of those three, and. Uh, I just want to say, are you finished with your yes. presentation? Um, this is excellent work product. I mean, we are very, I personally am very happy with it. I, um, well, this is a very thorough and um, inclusive analysis and inventory and assessment that we've never had, shockingly and surprisingly. And um, I feel like our taxpayers should feel very good that they, their money was well spent on the work that you've done. It's um, and it will be. It will guide us for decades to come. This work. So thank you. Uh, I want to call out one of or two of your suggestions right away, that we are actually already discussing and moving forward on. Well, several of them we've already taken some action on, but one that hasn't really come out yet is the um, your suggestions about the Wayne Senior Center. And we are in active discussions with the Wayne Senior Center to come and use the second floor of this building. Um, and that a potential leash, lease should be on our um, agenda shortly. Sure. So um, we're moving forward with that idea. They are very enthusiastic about it. We're enthusiastic about it. And um, so that came directly from your work already. We're already seeing um, fruition of your hard work. What we do with the building that they vacate it remains to be seen. Hopefully, if we monetize it, it'll I mean, it's a disappointing number in your report of what it's worth, but we'll, we'll see what happens with that building. It, at the very least, it will stop being a money pit for us, so um, that's a positive. Um, in general, I, um, I want to just call, recognize and note, you know, some of the discrepancies that, that we have talked about are the divergences of this op opinion of what underutilized is and what value is. Um, you know, in your assessment and analysis, value is given to our open space and parks in terms of its active use. And that is certainly one way of looking at the world. In your, from your perspective, that's the measurable and um, logical way of looking at it. In this township, and for many of the commissioners here, there, we do here put a very high value on passive open space that you maybe no one ever uses. And we've had an open space program for decades that takes, that funds that, and um, we appreciate the, that value. So I'm not saying that as any way a criticism of the assessment va matrix that you used. I'm saying it more as an explanation to people who read this report that some of the decisions this board and future boards make will not necessarily comport with what's in here because our value system of what a passive open space brings to our brings to our township is different than the value system that you used. Um, so I think it's important that people reading this report recognize that. Um, 
And then finally, I, um, one of the questions, this actually isn't really for you all, it's more for John Rice, who it looks like isn't here. <laughs> Um, so I'll hold off on it. My, I, my, we, we've had this discussion before, and I wanted to just re make everyone recall that when and if we ever did decide to sell some of these parcel, parcels that were purchased with open space money, um, it's, a, it's a complicated procedure, not that it can't be done. Uh, and you have the legal parameters of having to go to orphan court, um, and if you then get through all of that and you sell it and you get your monetized pot of money. There's also then another analysis that has to be, that would this board would have to go to, through, and that is what do you do with that money? Now you have a million dollars that came from a piece of open space that was bought with open space money that was approved for voters specifically for open space. Can you spend that on anything but open space? Because that money came from your open space bond that was specifically pr approved for that use. So um, it's something that we all need to bear in mind and keep, you know, when we're having these discussions and it's tempting to look at some of these parcels and say, oh, hun a million bucks, duh, a million point five. It's not necessarily the case that even if we did get through Orphan's Court and were able to sell it, that we would have that for our general fund. We probably wouldn't. We would probably have to put it back towards open space. Um, so, those are just some points I wanted to call out, and, and finally I want to also, I don't even know if he's still here, but I wanted to say thank you to Mike, Ant there he is, Mike Antonopoulos for all of his work on this and for bringing Cressa to us, um, because in my opinion this worked out wonderfully and I'm thrilled with the work product. Well, I, for another day. Uh, but there were... There were some actionable items, I believe, that uh, from from terms of paperwork, uh, records, deeds, yes. and whatnot, uh, that you have that list, and that's been provided to the township at this point to, to yes. administration. It's uh, it's it's in uh, phase three, and uh, there's a copy of it mm -hmm. attached to what you had here. So we need to prioritize those items. Uh, and hopefully act to clear up those uh, discrepancies, issues, reporting. Some, some of them are, you know, as an example, you have five pumping stations <clears throat> that are operating on property you don't own or lease, or you have eas you don't have easements on them that we can find. Th those are the things that I would push right away. That would be top priority. Right. Uh, I think this board should give direction to John Rice to do to pursue that. Is that something John Rice wants to do? <laughs> well, it's going to involve, I think, um, some contact through the manager's office with the homeowner who may not be the homeowner that was there when it was first built. Um, it's got to be some kind of a drawing or a plan. Usually you, you draw some area around there and there's a lease uh, for something like that. I don't know how much area Steve Norsini would think that we would need, but there may be an access issue. I'm not familiar with the, the, the properties, but someone's going to need to hold the hand of the landowners who may or may not know what's on their property, depending on what the circumstances are. I don't know. Since there are pumping stations, I don't think any landowner would object to it. No, I think what Commissioner Fisher is speaking about is all of the items that you've mentioned yeah, right. as actionable yeah. items yeah. there. That and staff will be working with the um, county as well as with the solicitor taking care of what needs to be done on that aspect. So I think where you're going is different than what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. I just want to make sure that we, we take all this great information that you've given us and act on it and come up with a schedule. And I, the manager's going to, of course, do this, but if there's any immediate action that this board should authorize tonight, you know, I, I don't know. It sounds like that's a good one. Yeah, I, th I think what we're going to do is we're just going to start moving on a lot of these items here because, again, a lot of these items deal with the county, making sure those are cleared up. And then items where we need to engage the solicitor in, they've done a nice job of pointing those out so John doesn't have to go through it. And I know we were just speaking before about, you know, we know there's some expense that's going to take place, but it's probably expense that should have taken place over the last 30, 40 years. So we'll see that now, but at the end of the day, we'll have a product that actually we will know what real estate the township has. It will be recorded appropriately down at the county level, and this way then the assets of the township are, someone can find them. 
Okay, thank you. And, and if I may, um, some of these things where we didn't find easements, um, former township solicitors may have records that aren't on file here. So you may check with them as well. And the, the, uh, there are documents, that, that it was explained to us that there are a large amount of documents in storage. I, I assume you were not able with I the, went you went through, okay. There's other things we were looking for specifically. Right. And I couldn't find them. There's a lot of documents down there. Okay. But uh, I went through a lot of boxes. So like, to your point, maybe a former solicitor might have copies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Quite yeah. possibly. Yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. So well, thank I you. Do, I do have two, uh, two couple more of comments. Uh, there, there is some, in my opinion, there's some low-hanging fruit that I, I recognize what you were saying, Elaine, about the, the value judgment. But for me, there's some low-hanging fruit that probably fall out of that. And so I think staff should come to us with some of those items. Um, and then I'm also, we, we use potential stormwater impact, but a lot of these wet parcels that we bought because they were wet aren't going to have any stormwater impact. So before we use that as a reason to have a passive use of land, we ought to get a sense that, that that's actually going to happen, not just, you know, say stormwater and then that becomes a reason. And, and then set, the last thing is, I think you're right that there is a, there's a value judgment on this passive land, but we should have like a big rambling, mumble, uh, muddling through type discussion, and then at some point we got to get particular because my sense is that there is opportunity to m see some real savings from this, so I, I think we should uh, pursue that. And it won't be all of them, it'll still be very sensitive, but my sense is that there is an opportunity to change the way we're using our land and see some real savings. I mean, there are, what, what a number of cities or townships do is they set, they put up a level of service standard, <clears throat> which for, for, for a lot of things, including parks and open space, <clears throat> how many acres of park land do you need for every thousand residents in the town? Now, it doesn't, it doesn't set up a firm block, but at least it gives you an idea of do we have way too much or not, not, not enough. And, uh, you know, that's one thing you can consider. Do you, do you want to try to put, a, put your arms around a level of service standard for parks and open space and, and whatnot? So, so for me, uh, kind of going back to that original matrix that you'd put up, trying to move uh, our parks to an efficient frontier along the diagonal. So if they're low utilization, try to get them to the point where we have low maintenance, low maintenance costs. Mm -hmm. If there's high utilization, then we can, we can afford the higher maintenance costs. But there were only two parcels that were in that lower right-hand quadrant that were, you know, low utilization, high maintenance costs. And so this becomes, this is, I think, a policy decision by the board of how much maintenance do we want to do on a piece of land that isn't being utilized at a high rate? Right. And do we, you know, do we cut the grass every week? Should we? Does that make sense? And to a larger question, some of the larger parcels that we have, we, we cut the grass. And the question, you know, if they're open space that is uh, not utilized even by passive activity, um, should we be maintaining that land? Should we just let it kind of be natural and let the grass grow, to, you know, the fields grow? Mm -hmm and so on, you know, because we're spending millions a year in maintenance, yes. and we need to figure out, I think we've made some adjustments over the last couple of years, but I'm still seeing a lot of, you know, beautiful place, but does it make sense to cut 30 acres of grass in one park? Does that make sense, you know, year round anyway? Mm -hmm. right, thank you. Any Thanks other comments? Thank All right. You. Thanks again. <clears throat> Elaine, can I just say something? Yes, Michael. <clears throat> the one thing is um, we're talking about open space here, and I'm a taxpayer, but the one thing you have to look at is not only the, 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 the lack of maintenance cost, but whatever, whatever you would sell a piece of property for and whatever the taxes you would receive on that. So right. that comes down to the bottom line. That mm -hmm. being said, 
<clears throat> there's no right there's no right or wrong answer but there was a cost for open space and then what mm -hmm. what, what this was meant to do is just present to the the board and the community mm -hmm. uh the, the 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 appropriate basis to, in order to make a value judgment mm -hmm. as they s start to evaluate that right. it's just not the maintenance cost right you have to take all the costs it's the lost drop. revenue it just comes yep. what drops to the bottom line so and I would just add to that, you know, this wasn't reflected, I don't believe, in the numbers when coming out with the, you know, the balance of what you went, but not only do you have lost revenues, but you also may have school children <laughs> in the, every property that you let go to development. Sure, you get some revenues in, but you also get 2.5 children per household. <laughs> so you have to factor that all in. And, you know, at $18,000 a pop per year, the school children can really affect the, the math. We have, do, you, uh, do we have some public comment for this? That Hello. Hello, Elaine. Hi, everyone. Sarah Armstrong, Radnor resident. Um, so glad to see that report tonight. One comment uh, mentioned at the end of the presentation about uh, level of service standards. Um, I want to point out that if you refer to the CBFAC report from 2010, Rob Murdaka, who on the committee kind of headed up the real estate section of what we were doing, put together a great appendix in the back that, that details all of that. So that already exists. So I would direct those who are interested to look at that. Um, and uh, Commissioner Higgins, you had mentioned about the public works building and rebuilding one and whether that would be cost effective. Um, I've lived in the township since third grade and what I have seen over the years is really that stormwater management coming down. So I think part of that equation would be if we could do something smart at the public works building or where it is now for stormwater management because being at St. Catharines, I see that water just coming rushing down. And if you could do something very smart right where that public works building is currently, you could save a lot of money on stormwater management because it just goes right there down the hill through the grotto and all through Wayne there. So I would put that as part of the, the financial analysis. So I'm not an engineer, but I do see the water coming. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good night. Hi, Dan Webster, 242 Ravenscliff Road. Um, will this presentation be posted on the website? Yeah. It'll I'm go. Sure. Up, it'll go up tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. And and where will it be posted? The front page. Okay. Um, was phase the phase one and phase two reports posted? Because I never remember them being discussed. In a, I wasn't here at the August 10th meeting, but I have been here at the other meetings, and I don't remember ever being a presentation. I don't know. Maybe those were Carfac presentations. Were, were they border commissioner presentations? I don't believe we have discussed this yet. Yeah, yeah. It, this is the first time we've discussed okay. it. So it's the first time you've seen all all these reports or discussed them. Are the, are phase is one and phase two reports going to be posted as well? I don't know the answer to that. Do we have those up on the website now? We'll verify to make sure they are. But I do believe Cressa has been here before that spoke about these. So we have had that discussion before publicly. But it was it was months ago. Yeah, we we, okay. we we had Krissa in here to present. Well, no, they they came in public and. I apologize. After, I, after I may have missed one, it. I, yeah, I, no, I there follow was a, most of the meetings. Yes. I there was a public one. presentation of their initial right. work after phase one. Um, at that time, I believe the report was put on the website. It's it's you may have to search for it. If it isn't there, we'll make sure to okay, put, put that up. Thank you. Okay. Any other public comment? All right. All right, I'm going to move on to the next item. I'm going to move to uh, approve resolution 2013-17. This is establishing the new supervisor of parking and auxiliary services position. Second. And I don't have any uh, comment. This is uh, just one more uh, piece of transparency. Normally, these types of things would, uh, in the old days, would just kind of occur on an administrative level. But now the board is being given an opportunity to vote on these types of things in public. Um, but uh, essentially, the directors have advised us that this is a position that they'd like to create. And uh, this is secondary to the prior uh, resolution amending the organizational chart. Uh, so that is my comment. OK, do we have any other commissioner yeah, comment or questions? Yeah. I. 
am I correct, this, this does combine, well, the third whereas combine, it says that the position combines the oversight of township parking regulations with responsibility for control of animals throughout the township. The memorandum that Bill uh, put together does, Bill White do, does not talk about animal control. Uh, so is the resolution still correct? Yes, the resolution is correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from staff, from the public? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes 7 nothing. And I have, I will move to uh, adopt resolution 2013-26. It's only for discussion. No. Oh. I'm sorry. Unless yeah, the I board would like to vote on it. So this is for discussion. Uh, this is to retain professional services for feas a feasibility study to be for, uh, performed by the Comcast Spectacor for the Township Recreational Facility. I'm going to ask Bob Zinkowski to comment on this and also if there's anyone here from Comcast Spectacor. No, no, they're not here no. today. Okay, so Bob, if you want to introduce this to us, uh, this is... Sure. Yep. Um, this is a... Uh, proposal that we had uh, started looking at as part of the budget process to looking at um, addressing uh, facilities that are um, in challenge conditions, uh, conditions or issues. Uh, and we had the opportunity and really want to commend uh, Tammy and Bill and Steve Norsini for bringing the caliber of a Comcast Spectacor to the table to have interest in participating with this in this particular um, project here. Um, this item was included in the 2013 budget. Um, what this does is take a look at a strategic approach and long-term planning, and it typically looks at not your government-run, government-operated recreation facility. Um, this looks at a creative partnership that would be created, uh, similar to what we've done at Memorial Field and also what we're looking to do at the Willows. It looks to solve a recreation facility problem, which we have at Sapezio Gym and the challenges that exist at that facility and the investments, as well as what we compensate Radnor Township School District for. Um, this also looks to increase our recreational opportunities for the entire community in all ages, which is important, which a lot of times recreational facilities looks at a certain age group. This looks to cover all ages here within the community. Um, there is a potential of uh, going after 50% uh, funding for redevelopment assistance. The uh, RCAP grant program through the Commonwealth uh, had a discussion uh, this morning with uh, uh, Vitaly's office and they said this would seem to fall within that criteria there to follow up with me uh, and seeing if this is one that we will submit on behalf of the township. Uh, the study is not site specific. It will look at the township as a whole and also may include non-township owned land which also would add a public private partnership uh, to be able to look to locate a facility on. This will not only be fo focused on ice rinks, uh, does not involve or focus on the flyers or the skate zone, but will include active and passive recreational services too, and outside the building as well. This study does not include the Radnor Memorial Library. Uh, they are currently um, satisfied with the location they have in town. Um, I know we had met with some of the board members. They're looking to do an expansion and the potential fundraising option to be able to renovate and expand that current uh, facility where it is at. Uh, it does not include involving Radnor Studio 21 or the Wayne Senior Center, uh, as spoken before. The Wayne Senior Center uh, is looking at this facility as well to bring this, uh, this building up from 38% up to 100% uh, utilization. So it's kind of a different approach here um, of what we're looking at doing. Um, this looks at creating, again, a public-private partnership with a major company, uh, which would look at providing the operations, the maintenance and management of the facility. So again, this is one of the big moves away from how typical governments do it, where it's government staffed, government operated where we are looking to get away from that to where we don't have to add staff that maintain a, a facility, manage it, and provide the operations. We will provide a portion of the programming. So in recreation community programming, in Tammy's department would be able to take programs within that facility. But again, too, we're not responsible for mopping the floors, cleaning the floors, changing light bulbs, all those things which should be done on a, 
on the outside with a private management firm. Um, there were previous studies that were completed, uh, assuming all the costs associated with operating and maintaining the facility with the township. These are a stack of the facilities, uh, studies that were done. And we have spent, uh, when you look at these numbers, uh, including the studies and the surveys, we're almost looking at $40,000 that we have spent on these reports, which basically nothing has been done with them, in my opinion. I mean, they look good. There's probably some conversation that has taken place. However, for the same amount, we've spent money on these reports that from 2002 through 2007, and basically they haven't provided us much with anything except the typical government operates it, which then impacts employment, pension, OPEB, health care costs, all those things where we're looking to try to set a model and move away from those types of things. Um, and again, uh, this is something we're looking at a different approach, something that's different that government has to look at. And even though, Kevin, I know you mentioned that I've been government for most of my career, which I say that, we're actually looking at the business side of the model to where incorporating someone like a Comcast Spectacor, they're in business to make money. They're not in business to that's lose money. That's why they should pay for the study, Bob. So, well, it, uh, we'll keep walking down that road. So hold, hold if you can just hold that thought. Um, again, this is a groundbreaking model that most communities uh, will be looking at, and I think this is part of this, really, the sales pitch that I think Tammy, Bill, and Steve had made, that this is something as a model that could go nationwide, because you don't have this where communities are looking at uh, someone else coming in to help manage these, uh, market these, to actually promote these. Uh, and you look at what the township has done with Memorial Field, I think that was a huge win to where, again, the township didn't have to use tax dollars to be able to improve that field, which basically all it was was the field. And now we generate a revenue on top of that coming in. We're also looking at doing the same thing with the Willows, to where we may not have to make an investment into that facility. It maintains its heritage uh, and its tradition, but again, is not being done with tax dollars. So I think this is what we should be looking at, these types of things. We spoke with Carfac um, last week, uh, because I think they are the best group to be able to go through this first phase of the feasibility study because they're going to look at it from a business side, a business perspective. That's what we have those professionals for. I think you've uh, appointed a, a tremendous uh, group of individuals there who look at it from the business side, how this is going to operate, how this is going to be effective. And these are the types of things we're looking at, not always going to the taxpayer and looking at doing this. How can we create these types of opportunities? Uh, when you look at Sapizio Gym, I mean, in addition to the 30000 we just pay in utilities costs, it's, it's a challenge facility that we have. Uh, some of the concerns I have is the building has taken water on. I know we've addressed some of those with sump pumps, but we're not even putting water into that underground system at the middle school. So if it takes on water now, we start pumping a lot of water into that building, it's going to come back at this. Um, I don't think it, it, even if we make the investment into this type of facility, um, It'll never be an adequate recreational facility for the community. Um, it doesn't park itself well. Uh, even if all the resources were invented, uh, invested into this, uh, the amenities just aren't there in this type of facility. But again, these are taxpayers' costs that we would have to look at, um, and the impact also into the downtown Wayne area. Um, the overall management and the scope of this, uh, again, they would look at the ownership of the facility, perform the assigned management in that, all of these types of things are all handled on their end of this. So again, it takes a away from the amount of set staff that the township would have to hire, not only on a full-time basis, but on a part-time basis would be a huge uh, number that would have to come into. But I think there's also a lot of opportunities that come from this that the township could utilize that we're not using staff or taxpayers' dollars on. When you look at what Comcast Spectacor brings to the table, you look at the Comcast family, you look at what they do in the way of marketing and advertising and what they could bring to the township here, especially with an advertising policy that was recently adopted by the board. Uh, we had spoken to them with uh, Global Spectrum. They have a marketing wing in which they have a lot of people that uh, market and advertise for that. We had spoken about different opportunities to wrap, uh, like our trash trucks in that, again, as advertising opportunities that are done tastefully. You have the ability to pull on a major resource and a major uh, global company to be able to want to partner with Radnor Township, which is huge. Um, again, this is an action plan, not a consulting fee. So actually, as part of this, you'll see a business model that would be put together with this of what does it look like from the business side? What is, it, what is in it for the township? 
Um, I think this also gives us the opportunity, especially for myself, to be tasked with looking at creating and bringing business partners in to help pay for the cost of this facility. Um, so again, it's a different approach. This would be a cutting edge public-private partnership because of the nature and the um, stature of Comcast Spectacor, what they could do. Um, they have a proven model of, of success. They partner not only with the ICE facilities, but also uh, they work with colleges and universities throughout the country. They work with facilities like the Wells Fargo Center here in Philadelphia, uh, the Staples Center out in Los Angeles. So you're talking about a, a company that knows what they're doing. They have a very strong interest in Radnor Township here. And if they didn't, and they didn't think this would be a successful venture, they wouldn't be here. Um, again, you're looking at a state-of-the-art facility, um, expanded activities for all ages, um, provides multi-purpose space that can be utilized not only by our community groups and organizations, our seniors, and as part of the conversations we've had with the seniors, they're very interested in being involved in this type of facility. Um, there's a positive economic impact of what that would bring to Radnor Township. Uh, and again, this would be, in my opinion, the final recreational facility study done for the township, similar to what we did with the Chagrin Valley Engineering. Pretty much that has laid out a plan of what we have to do to address the stormwater issues. I don't think we need to stack anything more on it. This would be one from a final, this is what the facility would look like, what the opportunities that we would have, and also, too, is how much of the impact would be very little upon the township. Um, there's no additional costs. Again, pension and OPEB has been a big number here for the township. It's a big unfunded liability, so areas in which we can look at that have zero impact to that, we should be looking at those. And again, it addresses long-term financial capital and operating budget impacts. Because again, when we look at the facilities um, and what it takes to repair, maintain, uh, this brings us a great opportunity here to look at an unconventional way to help fund, manage, and operate a facility and bring the partners that are, have some business success, success, not only locally, but throughout the country and that powerhouse to be able to be brought here, I, I think this is a tremendous opportunity for Radnor Township to be able to walk down this road for the investment of $47,000, which you look at, you've got 40000 here we haven't really done, done anything with. Um, surveys, now you're able to put a plan together in which then this board of commissioners and the township can look at and say exactly what is this facility going to look like, where can it situate itself within Radnor Township, with all the different options and opportunities. What is this going to look like from a business model? What is it going to look like for the township? What is our expense at the end of the day? Is there a revenue that we can capture off of this? Well, similar to what we did, have done at uh, Radnor Memorial Field where we get a $35,000 check. So, I mean, these are the options and that's why I believe this is something we should look at, we should move forward with. I think it's a great investment here. At the end of the day, I understand Kevin's concerns is 47000 they should pay this. I also think there's some point where the township needs to make an investment here for our future too as well. And if this is an effort for us to where we will have one plan, not only of what the facility will look like, where it will locate, the impacts around the community, but also too, what does this look to us as a business partner so that we don't go the conventional way of adding a lot of staff and a lot of adding a lot of uh, impacts to the future financial situation. And when we look at the willows and all of this too, and we know we've got issues too when we look at stormwater, infrastructure issues, the OPEB issues. But also the township, I think the Board of Commissioners has done an excellent job here of addressing all these issues. And when you look at Sapizio Gym and other facilities that are gonna need significant dollars in how we operate to run more efficiently and more effectively, not for today, not for tomorrow, but for the long term. And it's just my opinion that the township is focused on today and tomorrow and not in the long term. And I think this board is looking at now at the OPEB, the pension, the infrastructure, the stormwater issues. This is it for the long term. And I think this is something really the township should consider. So I, I just have Wow, a, that was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple quick questions. Um, first of all, Bob, thank you. And to Tammy and all staff that have been involved in this, this is brilliant. I love the idea. In fact, I have a pair of a hockey skates in the front of my garage right now that we're going to go to charity, but I'm going to keep those now because <laughs> I think this would be great. Um, so the other benefit of this being a partnership with a business is that that business is subject to Act 511 taxes. So in essence, we may spend a little bit of money up front here 
to do our diligence, but we can assume that maybe even in the first year we may make some of that money, if not all of it back. So to me, it's, it's a low risk investment. Um, I was, I've been in the township since 86. We used to have a roller rink that was taken out and the kids lost that opportunity to have passive recreation there. It was a nice rink before that. That was before my time. <laughs> Someone told me today there was also a pool there. It was like a whole complex with a pool and a yeah. club. So, so we've, we've, we went through a period in this township where we kind of lost things. And I, I look at this as an opportunity to start gaining back activities, options. Not every kid wants to play ice hockey, but, you know, if the rink's open, for, just like the stadium and, and, and Haver Township is open, for recreational use on Friday and Friday nights, you know the the idea is you get to share the space. I also looked I looked at the brochures you gave us. It seems that these um, there are, there are at least four centers that have been opened, uh, one in Pensalkin, one in Atlantic City, Voorhees, and North Philly. And the fact that these are already being done, we're not the first township that this would be built in, uh, assuming we go in that direction. But the the point is these these you know these uh, private public partnerships do work uh, and I love the idea that we're not going to take on more um, burden um, in administration and operations and all that you know leave it to the professionals uh, especially something like that and um, but we get it we all get benefit so it's great thank you and one of the things and if I could just follow up on Commissioner Fisher's point is I know sometimes we get focused that this is ice, 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 but this is a big change for what their model is to looking at adding gymnasium, basketball courts, and again, multi-use to where you have facilities where you can utilize um, for indoor, indoor lacrosse, indoor soccer, uh, you know, those types of sports in basketball that we lack those types of facilities. So this gives us the opportunity to do that, you know, fitness trails, fit, not fitness trail, fitness track, um, a limited type of uh, workout area is part of this. But again, this gives us the opportunity to grow programs and based on what I see in this community here in the almost three years I've been here, the youth sports programs have been phenomenal. The adult programs are going. Uh, the senior programs are very interested with this and I was very surprised that when we spoke with Susan of the interest in actually the ice side of the world for the seniors to be, again, various opportunities. Um, so a lot of this is we, we, dis we have discussions in that. I think this is one that to get a plan together, to look at it, and then be able to work through this. But I think with Carfac being involved, this is really a business decision. So it takes it away from the typical government operation to look at it to more of a business perspective. Bob, uh, it, it's, just, it, it's wonderful, but there's a, there's a fundamental problem here. You cannot... We cannot spend township money to hire Comcast Spectacor to do a study, produce results for us, and then for them to build what they spec out for us. It's a classical organizational conflict of interest. If, if this were at the federal government level, they'd be disqualified. They could do the study, we could pay for it, but they could not turn a spade of dirt or do anything to construct or oversee the program. So if, if they want to be involved, I, I'm, I'm kind of with Kevin Higgins on this, they, they should spend the $47,000. Then there's no organizational conflict of interest. Then they can take the whole thing from, from study, writing the specs for the whole thing, and doing, all, doing the program management. But as it is now, we, I don't see our board. I, the, the federal procurement law would prohibit this, and I'm sure John Rice at the, at the state level, the Commonwealth, uh, you cannot uh, you cannot write specifications for for example in, in the federal specter you cannot write specifications for a radar system under a contract and then come around and bid on the actual procurement and installation of the radar can't do it and this is this falls into the classical um, classical mode of uh, organizational conflict of so I'm with Kevin on it. If they want to spend, if they want to do a study for us, then they have to spend the money, not not us. 
the only comment I would make to that is then we violated that rule when we did Agnes Irwin. They came to us with a proposal to renovate a field that was township facility and property. They paid for it. Um, so basically, we had this, that would be the same scenario. We didn't cut a check to them. We didn't spend the money on that, did we? Oh, I think by the time we spent money within the within the solicitor and staff's time, oh, we definitely spent money on that. So again, so maybe with. maybe we can look at that issue. That, I mean, yeah, that's we'll a distinct at, issue yeah, to we'll look this. At that issue. And I, I I agree. But what you're going to have here is you're going to have them produce a work product that leads us right down the garden path to hiring them to building this program for us. That, that's not right. That's not necessarily true. Um, there's an opportunity to where. At the end of the day, the township could be the one that builds and constructs this facility, and we contract with them to manage it and operate it and maintain it. Um, that comes with the opportunity for us to raise those types of funds, which I spoke about earlier, uh, for myself to go out and find those dollars to be able to build this facility. But we don't know that until we're at that point. So it's very possible that after this study is complete that they have done, the township will have some decisions to make on whether or not they are the ones that construct it, whether or not we're the ones that construct it, or if we have another party that would like to construct this facility until we have those answers. Well, they, they should make the decision. That they should understand. I, and I, I think we ought to, somebody should make it clear to them that if they do this study for us, then they're disqualified from, from, the, from doing if, anything on the I, program. And if the, if the board would approve this, I, think, I will make them aware that they would not be able to construct this facility. But I think we need clarity. I, I'm not disputing what you're saying, but we see cities enter into relationships with sports teams all the time. In many cases, completely fund the, the construction of a stadium. You know, for the betterment of the community. So we can, we can do that here with Comcast. Yeah, they just can't do the study that leads us. To well, that maybe, point. maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have, want it to be legal. Right. Oh, I, want I it to have, be legal, I have so I no problem going back if, if this is approved. I have no problem going back to Comcast to say that if they do the study, that they cannot construct the facility. I have no no problem with them doing that. They can do the study and just pay their own forty-seven thousand dollars, and then they can build this the facility. Well, Correct. they could, but but Correct. Comcast, but Comcast yeah. will walk. So the opportunity is we'll let them go somewhere down the road. Here's an opportunity, a very, very smart business opportunity to where we can shed ourselves of facilities that are in desperate need of repair to spend millions of dollars. Or we can just say, well, either you're going to pay for it, which they're not going to. So then we can hire an architectural firm and do the same, put a facility together for us and then try to shop that. But we're looking at, we had another proposal at 49000 And that was from an architect that would put, it, put the drawings and the plans together, the same thing. At the end of the day, it's all on us to be able to build and construct it. So I have no problem with going back to Comcast Spectacor and saying, you do the study, you cannot build the facility. And I think they would have no problem doing that. And Jim, I don't know if that answer, would that seem to satisfy your? Well, I'm, get, I'm getting into an area here. It, it's a legal issue on whether there's an organizational conflict of interest under state law or under, under local law. And I'm, I'm not going to offer an opinion on that. That's John's area. Well, why don't, I mean, it's an issue, any private partner, private-public partnership project, there's always issues regarding what a public entity can do versus what a private entity can do. Um, just so I understand this, I want to talk to Bob about this, and I'll give you an opinion as to what the problems are, which may be distinct from federal law. Jim, you mentioned federal procurement law. You know, you've got the charter, and you've got some state law, and you have some bidding issues. And that's really is going to govern it. And it may be that Radnor can do things that federal government can't do, believe it or not. Well, it's um, not just a legal issue, though. And, it's a, and there's a policy right. issue here, too, which is I'm not going to render an opinion it on it. It just looks like they're going, to, they're going to do a study for us that leads us into adopting their 18 or 20 page program to, to do this wonderful facility. And I, I love the idea. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I, I like the idea. At least I think I do, based on what I've read. But I just don't see us being led like a bull with a ring through its nose into um, their program. Um, so I'm going to make my comments now because that sort of segues into them. First of all, I'm very intrigued by this. I think um, have you know if, if we're ever going to get a recreation center, a, part, a public-private partnership is the only way we're ever going to get it. Um, and um, I can see this working out with some partner, whether it's Comcast, who knows. 
when I look back at the last time we went around this and tried to get a recreation center up and running with the a feasibility study, the two big stumbling blocks were location and the cost, the financial stumbling block was the cost to maintain it, the cost of staffing. So this type of partnership would address that second stumbling block, I think, if we found a partner that would take on the maintenance. But we still have the big location problem looming out there. So that's one issue. Um, in, in When I read through these materials, it looked like an ice rink that we were looking into, which may or may not be a good idea. I don't think that we've had any kind of discussion at this level or even with our residents about whether we want a, an ice rink, um, which is one of the reasons I, um, you know, from, a, from my conversations with my colleagues, I decided we really needed to just discuss this tonight and not vote. I, I think many residents that are hearing this today or read about it on Patch or whatnot, it's the first time they're hearing it and they're saying, an ice rink? How interesting. But I, I think it needs to percolate a little bit. Um, and that an ice rink and all of these facilities that this place, as Comcast Spork Spectacor has done before, are very large. I mean, by definition, they're large because it, you need a big rink. Um, and m several of them have several ri several ice sheets, um, and we're not ju we wouldn't just be looking for an ice rink. We'd be looking for a gymnasium and an ice rink. So we're talking a lot of square footage here, which exacerbates our location problem. So these are some things that are going around in my head that I think we really need to um, clarify before we move ahead. You know. We have already decided, we have already discussed that we're going to spend $50,000 on a study. So I'm, I think we're all committed to that. We'd like to see this idea go forward. But we, we're not going to spend $50,000 more than once. So I feel like this feasibility study has to really cover what we're looking for. And I don't know that we've decided an ice rink is what we're looking for. Um, it, it sounds like they, this company would also provide plans. I hope they would also provide plans for a facility that did not include a, a, an ice rink. Um, it, didn't, I, I, it was hard for me to find a client that they listed that didn't have an ice rink, but I think they do. Um, but I would want to be assured that their feasibility study would include things other than ice rinks um, and, and, and an assurance that this group that we're going down this road with would still want to partner with us if we weren't doing the ice aspect of it. Um, so those are really my comments. I, I, I also, you know, when we started talking about a recreation center a year or two ago, we really primarily were talking about it in the center of Wayne, trying to incorporate Sulpizio or the library building or whatever happens to the building behind the post office which rumor has it has just recently changed hands. Um, and that needs to be a part of this conversation as well, because that is a logical, it has been a logical spot. And um, depending on what happens with that newly acquired property, you know, whatever we get from this feasibility study, I would like to see be able to play, you know, fit there. And if that is the case, there's, there's no way an ice rink is going in the center of rain, Wayne. It just wouldn't fit. So I think these are all things we kind of need to, a, per percolate on, amongst ourselves, but B, go back to our residents and see how, what they're thinking, what their reaction is to these things and, and, um, and where the location might be appropriate. And, you know, do we want an ice rink? Do we want to go down this road at all? I mean, personally, my kids all played ice hockey. I love ice hockey. I would love an ice, ice rink in Radnor. Anybody who's ever played ice hockey would say that because it, you have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, but, you know, I'm just one person and I haven't heard a peep from my residents about, that I represent about it. So that is, um, you know, I think it would be good for us all to go back to our residents for the next two weeks to get a feel for what people are thinking, you know, keep an eye on Patch and, and, and see how people are re receiving this and then move ahead with this. 
Madam and President, I, the mm -hmm. only thing I would have to say is I would not rely on Radnor Patch because <laughs> to me is when I look at blogs, those typically are gutless people, spineless people that won't put their be name nice, to it. Nice. So um, that's my kind version of the words. Yeah. But basically to listen to that, that could be one person that I can go on and put ten different names onto it and then all of a sudden it sounds like, wow, this is a great thing. The issue well, is, is you have well a taken. survey, you have a study that's mm -hmm. been done that basically show where the needs are. I, I understand where the board is at on this. However, we can discuss this. We can be still discussing this seven years from now, saying where does it go, where doesn't it go. I think that's where you need professionals to come in and tell you. And under a different model, this is an entirely different model. And really to put any facility in the middle of Wayne, um, it's not the center of town. I think we're creating more issues there. We have problems now that everybody complains we don't have enough place to spark park, where we would take a facility, would take parking away. So I think we need to look at township-owned property because what we would be looking for is acquiring property. And I think what we'd want to do is look at what township property has to come up. And this would establish a footprint that we could overlay on all different part, parts of the real estate that the township owns. Um, but again, too, is, and no disrespect to the board whatsoever, but, but we, we could talk about this for, again, this was started in 2002. It's 2013. And we're back at square one again. I mean, we could be talking about To be about fair, this. we've had a lot going on in the last five years. And I agree with you, Bob. We, right. it, we, it would serve us well to have professionals come in and look at this. My concern is that these particular professionals have a bent. <laughs> Their expertise right. is ice hockey rinks. So that may be appropriate. And I just don't know that. that right. That's what we want. So... And I, I think as part of that, we would go back to them and ask them to create two plans, one that mm -hmm. includes ice and one that exactly what you talked about, take the ice off of it and then look at just a facility that talks gymnasium and mm -hmm. have that footprint too as well, which I think we can go back to them and ask them to do. Well, for years, for years we've talked about an indoor facility and the, uh, the problem was locating it and getting the funds to do it. We have Sulpizio Gym, which you're right, we're probably going to sink hundreds of thousands of dollars into that, and it's continually going to be a problem. In 1970, when I was commissioner, they wanted to build an ice skating rink right here and um, let us lease in the ground for a dollar a year, and we would own the ice skating rink after 25 years. I could get no support for that. But I can say ice skating rink in Radnor Township would be a pro very progressive, tremendous opportunity for this community, and uh, I would support that. The problem is the location of this study will help me find a location. I'm 100% in favor of that. So uh, my sense, I'm open to it. Uh, I'll evaluate it, uh, but um, I have all the reservations of the colleagues that have expressed their reservations, so I won't add to them. Uh, but I will be open to it. I need to see more of a grassroots interest in this. And then I need to see more of a process that followed like what we did on the Willows, where we had a conversation about what we want to do with it. This seems like the decision has already been made, and uh, so it seems like we got ahead of ourselves a bit. So I, I need a little reservation uh, before I would proceed with something like this. Bob, you're going to have to do a lot of convincing to get me to spend another $50,000 on uh, another study on this. And, and on top of that, there's a phase two element to this that hasn't even been discussed tonight. And if this is such a good idea and such a valuable idea for them, they'll do this themselves. Otherwise, if we're paying them to do it, they're not fully convinced. But if they think they can make money at this, then we're just offsetting some of their costs. And I don't think we should pay for this. Yeah, I'm going to be very surprised if they can find a location that would house the kind of facility that you need to build to be able to generate the income for this to be a, a viable thing. I mean, I think it was 95 to 2000 range. We had the one plan that Bob Miklas worked on with the... Uh, indoor facilities committee from the parks and rec board. Um, we had a nice design, it included gyms, it included a track, it included exercise rooms, meeting rooms. Uh, and even that, you, you could never generate the cash flow you would need. Um, and that was pretty big as it was. So, I mean, I, I think we do need to go with a professional study. I'm, I'm not opposed to that, it's just that I agree that we've kind of, I think we jumped ahead to ice rink. Um, and that's, the, when I read this, I thought you were talking ice rink. And compared to the conversations we've had previously, which were more about, we were talking about the senior center and the library and 
the, even the township building possibly being part of a government center. So that's this threw me when I read it. I'm sure we're, we're not going to talk about this for six years. We'll be making a decision whether or not to do the study within either the next meeting or the meeting after that would be my guess. So we just need some time to chew on it with our the people we represent. So uh, I'll just reiterate, I do support the idea of this. Um, it'll be great to see more detail. And I'll just comment, I've never set foot on the turf fields in the township, never once. But if you build an ice rink here, I'll be on that rink, mm -hmm. playing hockey, skating. So just lost my voice, John. Okay. okay, do we have a, um, someone who wants to make a public comment about this, Sarah? And also, we'll get comments from the folks in the suburban. That's they're better because they screen their comments. Sarah Pilling from Garrett Hill, and I'm one of those people who did blog with my own name on Patch today. Uh, I've come to every one of these meetings <clears throat> for probably the last nine years, and I have never once heard a member of the public come and ask about a hockey rink. I remember a survey we did several years ago. I remember your surprise, Bill, that not many more people wanted to play basketball, and the two features that came up were water for exercise and fitness. And I think part of this discussion, do keep in mind, that the Ardmore Y is closing down. and It's moving to the Bulgum factory in Havertown. And there are going to be more people this way who are going to, who would come to Radnor if there was some sort of water exercise and decent fitness. I, you know, hockey's wonderful. My kids were not allowed to play because the, the times they got to practice was three in the morning. And I'm sorry, I love my kids, but I was not getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning, or I was doing the traveling. I think the public, really, the residents of Radnor Township, really have to look at this. I think in concept, a fitness center, a sports complex would be wonderful. But if it's just hockey, I, I don't think that meets the desires and the needs of the residents of Radnor Township. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. All right, well, I think we'll, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Dan Webster, 242 Ravenscliff. I like the idea and I appreciate the um, uh, going outside the box to look at these things. One thing that I don't hear much discussion about, a couple of people have mentioned it, is how this ultimately gets paid for. Because you're talking to build a facility like this, I have to think $20 million, $30 million. This is a big facility with a lot of space, a lot of parking. Um, so before you go and spend $50,000, which I'm not saying wouldn't be a good investment, but it would be, wouldn't be a good investment if, if the board thinks that they are not ever going to spend that kind of money on a facility. And I don't know where, why we would ever take on that kind of risk of spending tens of million dollars of facil on a facility like this, um, that if we have to do it, it obviously doesn't make economic sense for the private sector to do. So it's, it's nice to hear that CARFAC is going to be part of this and they're going to help with the financial evaluation. But um, I, this sounds like these sports stadiums where they only work financially if the, if the municipality spend a lot of money to support them. So that would, I'd just be cautious about that. And the ongoing operating costs, Spectacor doesn't work for free, so they're not going to do this as a charitable gift to the township. So you just have to figure out what, what, what are the long-term implications of having this facility to, to maintain over time as well. But it sounds like, Bob, you're talking about having Carfax very involved, so that's a good thing. Thank you. And just to footnote that, we're not looking at 20 to $30 million to build this facility. Right? We're not in that ballpark. Okay. Hi. So in third grade, I went to Wayne Elementary, and Wayne Elementary had an after-school program. My mother was in law school, so she signed me up for it. I was picked up after school every day and taken to Radnor Ice Rink. And then got hooked on it, and I spent four or five hours a day from third grade through 12th grade on the ice. I was a competitive figure skater. And um, it provides a great opportunity for kids who aren't involved in maybe more traditional or team sports. Um, so I love the idea, of course, all the financial um, questions have to be answered in location, but I think done well, it's just the kind of thing Radnor lacks and Radnor needs to be competitive with uh, other municipalities. Uh, Plymouth Meeting, where my office is, they have a great indoor facility, uh, 
similar to what we're talking about here. Full disclosure, my husband works for Comcast. I should probably say that before. And you should put away, Bill, the, the Flyers Cup while we're doing this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, my son, you're talking about the ice rink. My son's first soccer game this past Sunday morning was at 7.20 Sunday morning at YSC. Where the, everyone is struggling for fields. The Radner, he runs Radnor High School indoor track. Their meets are at Lehigh University because that's where the indoor track is. So this presents a lot of great opportunity done well, which I know it would be, right location, right partners, maybe Villanova would also be interested. They're landlocked over there. They need some more sports uh, space. Could be really great for, and, and just what we're lacking and could raise the profile for Radnor again. So good luck with it. I think it's great. Thank you. All right, so we will put this on a future agenda, hopefully in, near, in the near future, uh, for a vote. And in the meantime, if you're watching this and you have an opinion, call your commissioner and let it be known. Uh, library. Jim. Library, I can announce that um, the Board of Trustees of the Memorial Library has three openings for board members. You can submit your qualifications, your resume to the library uh, board itself by going on to their website. Also, the township has one appointee to that Board of Trustees, and that position is also open. So all, all in all, there are four opportunities to serve on our library board. That's it for library. Public health. John Nagel. No report. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to, to raise two issues. Um, the first is the condition of our parks with the tremendous number of geese that are um, spoiling the turf. I took my grandsons to the Willows at Christmas time, and it was like a minefield. You had to watch every step you took. So um, coincidentally, we had a resident write by email to our superintendent of police this week, um, yesterday I think it was, asking for the, our staff to look into the problem. And I think, um, Superintendent Collarol, maybe you can tell us what's going to happen? Uh, yes, Commissioner. Uh, we have uh, two different uh, entities looking at the problem. Uh, the USDA, as you know, who we liaison with the deer calling, uh, they're giving us a proposal as far as uh, the geese. And also Alan Strickler, who we use on occasion regarding deer and other animal issues, is giving us a proposal as well. There is going to be a monetary figure attached to that, and we can have a full report for you and the other commissioners at a future meeting if you'd like. Tammy, what happened to the goose guys? I mean, it's been a long, long time. I stopped that operation as soon as I started here. We were paying huge sums of money for someone to bring a dog down and chase the geese away. They flew across the road, and they flew back like 20 minutes later. So I stopped that operation. I mean, though, I do wonder if eventually on that property we do have a caretaker, either at the cottage or at the mansion itself, I mean, wouldn't a dog solve the problem There's on the property? It's your police dog, Bill. <laughs> one, of the, one of the proposals by uh, Alan Strickler is to use dogs and okay. uh, to charge us a certain amount of money each month. Uh, we're, we have to be very careful with the geese, though. They are protected, uh, the eggs and, and, and things like that. I, I, I thought I got an education with deer, but I'm getting more of an education now with the geese. These and, geese uh, are protected? Uh, to a certain extent, you just can't are, go out. These geese are messed up. They're supposed to be migrating, and they yeah. stop. I, I they saw know them a crossing Lancaster Avenue yesterday morning, so, you know. Tried to run one over. Well, Radnor's I mean, a great place to live. I mean, uh, Chief, Chief uh, when I go down to my softball fields, I have to get out a broom and sweep all the, f you know, the whole infield is just loaded with crap from geese. I'm, and, you know, I'm sure this is on all our fields. You know, we have this problem where we get, you know, these things all over the field. I mean, it's a health hazard for you know, everybody uh, Commissioner, there, there's no doubt that something has to be done. In fact, uh, we even had Larry Taltone from the health department today uh, check with a couple of uh, uh, organizations regarding the water quality because of uh, what's happening to the water supply. So, uh, you know, with the township managers and the, and the commissioner's approval, we'll come up with a plan. Uh, I'll just have to attach a, a value to how much it's going to cost. I'd like to suggest that we involve the parks board 
I mean, Parks Board, who was the ones that addressed this issue originally, we had done some quite creative things. We had strung monofilament. You know, we had experts that met with us and told us of the many things you can do. Um, the monofilament, the goose bumps into it. Shaking the egg sounds ridiculous, but you, when if you destroy the egg, they'll just lay another egg. But if you shake the egg, it kills the egg, and then they they stay there. So th there's a lot. Of, this is not new to anybody, especially Radnor Township. Uh, we actually hired a guy to trans capture and transport geese, and the geese got back here before he did. So this has a long history in Radnor, and I, I'd be interested in anything we could do, because it is absolutely a shame what they do to our park. Could we look at this differently, though? I, when I think of the park, I think of, uh, well, let's put it this way. The geese were there before we were. So I would assume, I would assume, because it's a... They were migrating. Yeah, but, but here's the thing. If you don't cut the grass, I believe the geese won't find that interesting. They find it interesting because the grass is cut so much there. Maybe there's a way to modify the, we, the way we cut the grass, maybe cut less of the grass. Well, that's what we did along the, the stream. Area. Yeah, and, but because I don't have a problem with geese on my lawn, so, you know, the geese are attracted to that area for a reason. I just don't know what that is, but, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to get them out of there and by using dogs and whatnot. Why not look at... Why are they attracted in the first place? Commissioner, if we can, we'll come up with a plan with the police department. We'll present it here to the board. Jim, did you have another issue? Or? Yes, I do. Um, and John Nagel and I exchanged emails on this uh, last week. Uh, I've had two constituents ask me to raise the issue of a feline leash law in Radnor Township. I understand that our Board of Health had made findings on the subject of uh, domesticated cats, and I suppose feral cats as well, uh, roaming um, loose in the township. And uh, I guess two years ago, those findings were reviewed by this board and were rejected or sent back for further review. I don't, I don't know all the details, but I would like to, at this point, ask uh, Bob if we could have our Board of Health um, either appear here, the chair, the chair person appear here for us or uh, send up to us their report of two years ago so we can look at it and decide what perhaps further action is. Don, you want to jump in on this? Uh, we did that two weeks ago. Two, two meetings ago, we had, the, we had the ordinance here and it was here and you had your feline leash law and it was up for a vote. And we well, there was no, no leash law. No, there, there was no feline leash element in that ordinance. Did that not have a feline? No, no it had been removed because we summarily uh, dismissed that idea. We never idea. addressed it. Um, Jim, I think the same thing will happen. We'll ask them to get involved, yeah. and they'll produce something, do a lot of hard work, and then this board won't support and them. And also, I think it had, it didn't say feline leash law, it just it had a prohibition on cats at large that for all intents and purposes was a feline leash law. So <clears throat> my sense is, Jim, Jim, this is what, I mean, there's an ordinance out there prepared by the Board of Health, unanimously supported by the Board of Health, that went through a lot of scrutiny, and my sense is we just vote on it. And we uh, bring it up here and let's have a vote. That's fine. And sure. we don't need any more. Uh, well, so we'll have discussion here. We don't yeah, need on to that vote. But we, we don't need any more adoption, okay. no more drafts. That's just fine. Have, well, we, based on our last meeting, I have given guidance to the Board of Health on what needed to be changed in that most yeah, recent Yeah, This revision. is my sense, though. The, the Board of Health has already told us that they disagree with the sense that some of us had about their draft. So my sense is we have to take their, that we got to give them an up-down vote on what they presented to us. So my, my, my advice to do what you want is to take the Board of Health document as the Board of Health submitted it, and then we have a straight up-down vote on that document. That's good. Okay, Thank you. so I'm, I'm very much in support of that. We'll have it on the next agenda. Very good. I right. tabled it. Thank you. Yes. So. It's tabled more than once. It's what? Right. It right. was ta well. We and tabled also, it because we weren't it looking at the Board of Health variant of that. At least I don't think we were. Remember, we had we weren't sure. We we thought we were looking at a at a document that was modified by, by the staff staff with input right. from us. Right. But my sense is that in in out of respect for the Board of Health, 
we should take an up down a straight up down vote on what they unanimously recommended. Okay. Uh, any old business? Any new business? Any public participation? All right. Will we adjourn? Second. Second. All right. All in favor?